hello, hello. Just one, two, one, Testing. two. Oh, Testing. 60 watching now. Whoa. Uh, 70. All right. We're not ready. We're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a bit of delay, but I think uh, I think we can start. Uh, I see that there's audio, so uh, why don't we begin? Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hey, guys. We, we're, we're sort of flying by the seat of our pants here, so we can all uh, sort of dive in together here, I guess. We're not experts. This is the first time we've ever done something like this, so, yeah. We're not. So welcome to Pitch Jam 2020. Yeah. Uh. Um, so I'm Rob Hoagie. Uh, I am a writer, producer, show creator. Um, I known for shows such as the original Teen Titans, which I was the head writer for. Um, we just did recently a reboot of uh, the classic uh, Thunderbirds, uh, which you can see in the US here on Amazon Prime. Also, along with these guys, did Nico and the Sword of Light, which is also airing on Amazon, and got a couple of new things going right now, unfortunately can't talk about, but um, excited to be here. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Jim Bryson. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, one of the creators of Nico and the Sword of Light, just like these guys, and uh, yeah, I'm a character designer and sometimes a director, sometimes a storyboard artist, a whole bunch of things, but uh, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> uh, I'm Adam Jeffcoat, uh, also co-creator of Nico um, and the Sword of Light, and uh, also a director um, and yeah, visual development artist. and. Um, yeah, we, uh, we thought we'd pull this little team together because uh, we all worked on Nico together um, and Rob has got a ton of experience in the industry. So we're going to try and uh, give you guys a little taster into what it's like to come up with a show on the fly. Yeah. So a lot of this sort of inspired by the, the, the idea of how writers and artists can work together and collaborate. Um, you know, sometimes this is, you know, a situation where you literally have a blank canvas and you start throwing ideas together and um, and somehow eventually you get a show. I mean, we'll talk about, you know, maybe a little bit later how Nico came to life, but it was, guys, you can talk about that. It was literally started with a, a picture of a kid with a mohawk, and, and now we've got an Emmy winning series. Um, sometimes it's that easy, sometimes it takes a little more work. But in the next hour or so, what we're planning on doing is taking a show concept. Uh, that we've already sort of talked through. So we basically have an idea of what the show is about, but then flesh it out on the page uh, and let all of you guys uh, have a chance to sort of see how the sausage is made in that sense. Um, and while we're doing that, and while the, the guys are drawing and, and, and coloring, uh, I'll probably talk a little bit about more of the business side of things and things you need to think about when you're creating a show. Um, we do have the chat window open on, on the stream and we encourage you to say hello um, and post questions. It is scrolling by really quickly. So if you do have questions, I may not be able to, to, to track those as we're doing them. Um, I'll do my best to answer things as we're going, but we will, are gonna leave some time at the end uh, to answer questions. Um, and so also uh, just one request, if you don't mind, I know we are all creative people and we all have ideas, but uh, if you can try not to offer specific suggestions in terms of what we're doing, um, this end up, could end up being an actual pitch we take places. So we wanna make sure that there's clean chain of title. Um, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, wow, we already got 227 people online. Normally oh, in, a, wow. in, a, in a live uh, audience situation, I would, um, we would ask the audience uh, some questions just to get a sense of who you are. Um, that might be a little tricky uh, in this format, but uh, would love to see if you want to throw in the chat a thumbs up or uh, something uh, similar. Uh, how many people out there are professional artists that are hoping to kind of use this as fuel for their own fires and pitching and selling a show? 
and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pause for a little bit because we found us about a 15 second delay between what we're doing on our end and what you're streaming. Uh, oh, uh, Adam, they wanna know what your cat's name is. Oh, uh, Tilly, <laughs> Tilly, yeah. Tilly. She's my little companion uh, yes. in my studio here, yeah. She's uh, never far away. Uh, yes. So Tilly is back there in the background. <laughs> um, Let's see. Okay, we got some uh, we got some thumbs up now about about pros. Great. Yes, I believe you will be able to stream this later. Yeah, I'm uh, recording it, so we'll we'll, we'll be uh, able to play it back later. Great. Um, should we Minus jump in swearing. And, and start drawing some stuff? So, so yeah, have to keep looking at it. So faces. great. So we've got a lot of pros, a lot of thumbs up. That's awesome. Um, so. We told you about what the goal is, talked about the rules a little bit. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna sort of give you the series overview, what we're gonna sort of brainstorm here today. A lot of people call that the elevator pitch. Um, we don't actually have a proper elevator pitch for this. So perhaps by the end of our time together, we will have one. But basically the idea is, is that I thought, hey, let's do a show about pirates. Um, we are gonna create a series, uh, an animated series for a younger audience. Um, and like the idea of a show about that sort of turn things on its head. So this is gonna be a series, a little girl her name is Penny, short for Penelope, who is the captain of her very own pirate ship. She also happens to be seven years old. Uh, Penny has a crew of five called the Sea Dogs. Uh, they're not actually dogs. They could be, uh, but they are just as smelly. And so together they travel the high seas, sometimes the little ones, aboard their amazing sailing ship called the Sea Beast. They look for adventure, treasure, and anyone that needs help. Um, but helping, of course, is not very piratey, but that's important to Penny. And since the captain's word is law and she is the captain helping is what they do best. So what we're looking at here is the idea of turning the kind of the pirate genre on its head in terms of expectations of kids of pirates that lie, cheat, and steal, and now have a group that actually help people. Um, so, you know, you talk about the idea of what is sort of a sentence that can grab people. Um, you know, you could say, okay, it's Paw Patrol, on a pirate ship. Um, I don't think we'll do that, but- um, it's a better voice acting. <laughs> that, is, that is a billion dollar franchise and <laughs> who wouldn't want that, right? Yes. Uh, so that's, so what are the, one of the first things that you wanna do when you're coming up with a series idea? Well, for me, it's always sort of know your audience. So who's this for? Right now, there's a big appetite for series that are in a, a zone called Bridge, which is not quite preschool. It's not quite normal animation. Uh, so that that so we're looking at this as a bridge show. So that would be you know from between the ages like four to seven, maybe four to eight. Um, so how old would Penny be then, if that's the case? I think Penny's seven years old. Okay. Mm. Uh, so you yeah. want her to be old enough to be believable as the captain of a ship, but also, um, you know, young enough that our younger viewers can sort of relate to her. That's something you're gonna hear a lot when you're creating pitching shows um, is relatability. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean the character needs to be the same age as your audience. Um, but I think that oftentimes it means that your character needs to have some aspects or qualities that your your audience can sort of get into and understand. Yeah, I remember. I'm sorry, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I remember them saying like, it's almost like the kids like to look up a little bit older almost than they're in. That is true. And that, that um, kind of touches on the other aspect of it. You hear about relatability a lot, but you also hear um, studio people talk about wanting their characters to be aspirational. Hmm. And th that seems to be contradictory. How can you have someone that's just like you, but someone you also look up to? Um, so that, that's one of the um, 
that, that's one of the things that we often have to deal with is sort of contradictory suggestions and notes. Um, yes, we are asking what software we're using. This is Magma. Uh, it's just open to Jim and Adam right now, though. Yeah, we thought it'd get pretty crazy if we invited everyone into this. Yeah. Uh, program. Uh, so using Magma for that. Um, and yeah, so basically you're looking at a, 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 a stream of, of Jim's desktop that we're throwing to YouTube. Yeah, yeah we'll, for, we'll, we'll be doing some things like uh, later on where we're sort of doing drawing jams with, 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 uh, with other people. But for this one, we wanted to just keep it to us just because we want to try and get like by the end of this, we really just want to have something completed um, as a pitch for this show. So we kind of have to, right. we've got a motor. <laughs> so so you, you've got an idea for a show. Uh, hey, it's about a, pi a little pirate girl named Penny, short for Penelope. She's called Penny because she, when she was found as a, as a toddler aboard a pirate ship all on her loan, lonesome, uh, she only thing she had was a, was a crazy treasure map uh, that didn't actually have any treasure on it and a necklace around her neck that had a small little gold coin that looked like a penny. So they call her Penny for short. Hmm. Um, so she's a mystery. She is a mystery. So we'll yeah. talk about backstory here in a minute. But the idea of like, well, when you come up with an idea, you know, or how do you know it's a good idea? Well, if it's something that you're passionate about and you think that is interesting, explore it. But then the next question is, how do you know it's something you can sell? Well, the, the easiest way is to ask. Um, if you have access to people that are actually buyers, um, well, you can say, hey, what are you looking for? Chances are, however, many people don't. Um, so one thing you can do, and again, looking at this specifically for, um, for uh, an animated series for kids uh, is, well, what's on the air right now? Um, and that's something that all you need is the ability to see what's on Netflix, to see what's on Amazon, to see what, what is on all the, you know, which right now is the main thing for, for streaming. Um, what's on Disney? What, you know, what's on Nickelodeon? Is there another show like this airing right now? Well, if there is, um, chances are it's might going to be a bit of a harder sell. Yeah, we've come uh, across that a ton. I would say, yeah. like in our experience, you know, where we've kind of spent a lot of time developing a show, um, and then they either say they've got something like it existing, or or they've got something like it in development. And it's one right. of the things we've noticed since the rise of streaming sites, and you know, there's so much more content around these days that that someone's always done some iteration of something and it's quite hard to kind of um, find a, a completely unique angle right. these days. There, um, there, so. there is, the, the, here's the, the, the thing that the, the sad and true truth is, is this the brilliant idea that you have right now that you want to try to go out and sell as a show, it's almost guaranteed that somebody else has already thought of that idea. <laughs> and more to the point, somebody else has probably already pitched it. So yeah. why even bother? Well, it's not just the idea; it is the app. It's the um, it's the application of that idea. It is what is you as an artist and creator can bring to it, um, and hopefully that's the one thing that's going to put it over the top. There are a lot of shows out there, you know, probably in development about pirates. But what's going to make ours different? Well, for one thing, it's got me, Adam, and Jim. Um, you know, we, we have something we can bring to the table. But perhaps this has that just that one little twist that makes it interesting. So again, how do you know what you have is something you can sell? Um, well, if, you, if it's not on the air, uh, it could maybe be on the air soon. How do you know that? Well, uh, it helps by being sort of plugged into the industry. Um, subscribe to Kid Screen Magazine. Uh, I think you can get a free subscription if you're in the industry. Um, read Animation Magazine. Uh, try to look at some of the industry um, publications, some of the industry, get on some of the industry mailing lists, um, because especially times of year when, when they're near the big, big markets like Annecy, Mipcom, uh, Kid Screen, a lot of the studios will post things about all the stuff that's on their development slate. Uh, their development slate. Um, and you can say, ah, okay, not only does that give you an idea of what other people are doing, and you can see, oh man, it's just like mine, I better change it, or it might also give you an idea of what other, what other people are doing. Um, but 
with the idea being try to get a, a lay of the land, try to get an understanding. And again, if you want to pitch a show to Netflix, sometimes it's good. Uh, if you have access to Netflix to pitch a show, chances are you're going to have access to Netflix to get what's called a general meeting. Uh, where that is where you'll be able to go in and introduce yourselves and find out what they're looking for. Mm. Um, and there's a good, it, and that's, it's good to, um, you know, sort of get, again, a sense of what they're, what they're looking for. If they say, you know, we really want an action show for a girl led action show for kids four to seven, um, you know, maybe, you know, something with a toy element. Um, and you say, oh, I've got the perfect thing, you know, and then you can go from there. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about Penny. Uh, Penny is a sidekick, not a pirate. It's actually a dragon. Um, the dragon's name is Scorch. Uh, the thing about Scorch is that everyone thinks it's a pirate. I, I mean, uh, uh, um, everyone thinks it is a, a parrot. Um, so that's kind of the, the running joke. That's a very unusual looking bird you have there, Penny. Um, he would like sit on her. He would like sit on her shoulder. She would sit on her on her shoulder. Yeah. yeah. So oftentimes, what we would do when we're doing um, sort of visual exploration like this, and, and these guys are doing some pretty detailed stuff, is we would do a whole bunch of sort of character sketches, sort of studies that would um, that that you sort of play with, and then you'd find the the poses and the the things that you like best, and and sort of go from there. Uh, and then you'd find little things too, like, yeah, instead of her telescope, periscope, monoscope, whatever, is it a kaleidoscope? I think that's a great idea. I love the idea that she looks through it and sees things uh, kind of differently. Yeah, we're uh, saying it would almost like um, the, the kind of adventure would almost appear through her kaleidoscope or something like that. Like it's, she sees it coming maybe and introduces the next adventure. No, that, that's true, absolutely. Um, let's see. Well, I'm, I'm listening through my notes here to see. Um, uh, so talk about, uh, I just want to mention backstory because we're going to talk about that in, in, in a little bit because it sort of gives the, 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 the world some, some sort of fun and flavor. Um, one, of, one of the dangers of a pitch is you is starting off talking about the backstory and, mm -hmm. and, and getting really into the, how it started and, 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 you know, sort of, you know, what, what all of the, the, the world building behind the actual show. And if you think about it, that sort of makes sense because if you track um, what you're doing, uh, if you track your frame of mind as a creator, that's the, all the stuff that got you excited about it. Mm. But keep this in mind, um, that's not exactly what is going to make a buyer excited. Um, that is part of the window dressing. So I always sort of go into this with the idea of what's the show? What, what are people going to see on TV or stream on their computers? And how, what's that gonna, how is that going to make it exciting? If you go into a pitch and all you're talking about is the backstory, I, I think you've 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 pretty much put the nail in the coffin there. Um, backstory comes in real handy when they say, hmm, "Tell me more," and then you say, "Ah, well, here is the backstory," and, and we'll we'll tell you Penny's backstory in a minute. So, the idea of a little girl and her dragon sidekick uh, and her very own pirate ship. So we talk about the aspirational aspect. So. Relatable, yes, Penny is a real kid. Generally speaking, the age of our audience are a little older, but what is aspirational about her? Well, she has her own cool pirate ship and she has a pet dragon. Um, that, that certainly is aspirational. Um, but Penny sort of turns the pirate um, sort of genre on her head. She doesn't have the Jolly Roger flag that she runs up. You know, hers might be, you know, a smiley, a, a rainbow smiley face. Um, so, you know, when, generally speaking, when, what do you expect when you see a pirate ship come? Do you expect them to, you know, the, the hoist the skull and crossbones? Um, you better run, you better hide because they're coming to cause trouble. But when Penny and her ship comes and you see that, you know, you see the smiley face flag come up, you're excited, the day is saved. 
finally, you know, someone here, someone's coming to help. Um, yeah, I love that idea. It's really cute to kind of flip, flip it on its head, you know, the whole pirate kind of right. cliche. Um, I don't think I've really seen that before. And, you know, like we were saying with experience with, with our own kids as well, that kind of teaching them the art of, you know, helping and giving is a, is a, bit, a big plus. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so let's talk about, um, let, let's sort of build out the, the, we've got Penny, we've got, we've got Scorch. So what, how do you build out the world? Well, there is a huge advantage of a team show. And we talk about team shows because oftentimes characters certainly can't exist on their own. You sort of have to build out the team. And, you know, this is sort of a staple of animated series from, you know, Time Immortal, from Scooby-Doo all the way now to, you know, you know, and anything else that's modern with a bunch of people. And the reason is, is that, is that you have your best stories with character and your best stories with character conflict. And conflict doesn't necessarily mean fighting, but means having characters that can play off of each other. Uh, and even though we have a lead, um, you know, we'll need other characters. So for Penny, it's her crew. Uh, Penny is the brave, bold, and daring captain. Um, you know, she knows how to rally her crew when she needs them and always is on the lookout for fun. Um, you know, she does that from what she calls the Dragon's Den, which is the crow's nest on the normal uh, pirate ship. That's her favorite place to hang out because from there, she always can have the best view of where to find uh, the next adventure. Um, but her team of friends, uh, her is called the Sea Dogs. Uh, now we talked about, you know, would they actually be dogs? And now here's a sort of creative discussion. Um, they could be, but then again, is that going to make it too much Paw Patrol where you mm. have a human kid with sort of the, the, the canine sort of team? Mm. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? So yeah, I, I was going to ask... We have a dragon in the show, so it, should we be making all the creatures in this show sort of like um, un, right, like not like sort of like weird, you know, mythical creatures, or do we see it as being like uh, uh, regular kind of animals, you know, anthropomorphized? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. Backstory time. Um, Penny actually comes from that part of the map when you see on the very edge where it says, here be monsters. That's where she comes from, and so does Scorch. So it stands to reason that there would be sea beasts, literal sea beasts, like the Kraken and, mm -hmm. you know, giant squids and all that kind of stuff that appear from time to time. Um, so someone just, I'm uh, just uh, asked if this pre-written. Uh, it wasn't entirely pre-written, but we did kind of come up with sort of a baseline from which to go on. Um, because otherwise we would just be spinning our wheels, making stuff up. Yeah, the um, pre-written is like a, what, like a page of- Disney Yeah, we've got like a, basically a page of ideas or so that we're, we're going there. So, all right, let's just assume then for the, the sake of fun, um, that, that the sea dogs are, um, all right, what do you want to say guys? Uh, I, I kind of like it being weird kind of yeah, um, like unex, um, just a mishmash of sort of bizarre kind of creatures. Yeah, because right. so just... so they're her they're her they're her sidekick from. Okay, so maybe she comes from the here be monsters, but she's the only human person that lives there, or that that that's that's from there, uh, and yeah. then the rest of her, the rest of her team is sort of the other sort of oddballs from from that. Like imagine if, if a you know a seven year old kid was going to make up some sort of imaginary friends on the fly. You know she would like I'm going to take like an octopus and and combine it with a with a you know um, a bear or something like that. You know so you got these kind of weird and wonderful kind of friends that right. That's great. Kind and, of beautiful, and, beautiful, beautiful and ugly at the same time. <laughs> uh -huh. And and here this is this is also uh, trading on again we talk about what what are your strengths. Um, one of our great strengths in terms of what Jim can bring to the table is he is better than anyone I've ever met at, at making 
these sorts of fun, cool, strange, amazing creatures. Uh, and if anyone had seen Nico in sort of light, uh, can can definitely back that up. Mm -hmm. So what about uh, what about the crew? All right, well, there's Salty. Salty's the first mate. Uh, um, and Salty wants to be a pirate more than anything else in the universe. Uh, he actually talks with the pirate accent, even though he doesn't need to. It's not his real voice. Um, he's sort of funny, like, you know, he might have like a collection of eye patches, even though he doesn't need them, and selection of peg legs for just in case. Did you have an um, idea for what kind of a creature Salty is? I'm just drawing weird. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, you know he, uh, he's, he, I, I see, oh, I'm just thinking of his character type. I mean, he, he's always about reciting all the pirate rules, which, you know, might never make sense. And I, I'm sort of seeing him, uh, you know, he's always threatening to make people walk the plank, but really that's the diving board to the swimming pool on the boat. So everyone's really happy to do it. And, and that sort of pisses him <laughs> off. Uh, he's sort of the Dwight Schrute of the crew, anyone that watches uh, The Office. So if, if he really wants to be a pirate, it would, it would be funny if he's like the smallest, you know, the, the least physically like a pirate out of all yeah, of Yeah, totally. Yeah, like, maybe you know, he's, he's kind of, like a little kind of rodent or something. Yeah, that might be <laughs> funny. Like a bilge rat. Um, uh, then there's Soupy, the ship's cook. Uh, Soupy knows six different ways uh, to make gruel, and that's about it. Um, uh, he's no, his, 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 you know, he's always on the lookout for a secret ingredient, uh, which could get him in trouble if they, you know, are off on a mission and he's off looking for something to make, you know, things taste better. So um, what was his name again? Soupy? Soupy, yeah. So, so here's a, you know, Soupy's kind of the guy where if he offers you dessert, always say no. Yeah. <laughs> um, the cook that can't cook, essentially. Yeah. Um, I thought of this uh, character named Widget. Um, so every ship needs a bosun, which is sort of the person responsible for making sure everything's working. Um, uh, so, you know, in, in sort of the, the, the widget could be the, the gadget girl, let's just say, um, you know, always coming up with crazy, inventions that make no sense. Um, but, you know, Penny's always looking for the positive. It can find a way to, to, to make even these crazy things work. Um, kind of maybe someone that could be like more of a big sister to Penny. Um, yeah. You know, this is probably the character that knows like 950 types of knots, sailor yes. knots, and is always sort of using them. So, you know, maybe she's got like a belt with like, you know, rope and stuff and, get, you know, also, also it's like a, a true belt. And, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's perfect. So she'd be um, able to she'd be able to climb around the ship. She'd be really agile. Right. Well, I was also thinking that we need a deckhand, um, and I, I was I was calling him or her witch. Um, originally, I thought it might be a monkey, but if we're, we're going to make them all creatures, then that that might make things different. But um, uh, you know, someone that can swing around the rigging. But no, you know, witch could do that too. I like the idea of like the character that doesn't talk, but actually is like that basically gets it all done. So like Winch could be the one that's always in the galley helping Soupy. And, and the only reason they don't starve is because Winch actually knows how to cook. And it's yeah. an open secret to everyone that, you know, this character does the real work while Soupy just sort of, they sort of let everyone feel like they've got a, a purpose. Um, then I figured we needed a navigator, calling him Blink. And the, but this is a character that could get lost inside a rain barrel. Um, but of course, that doesn't bother Captain Penny at all. Um, because, you know, for where they're going, there's no such thing as getting lost. Everything's a new adventure. So, so um, the navigator, would, would they sit on top of the, um, the crow's nest? And they could, of, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, th this might be someone who's like, you know, maybe a little older, a little more sort of salty, knows all the myths and the sea shanties and the rules of the sea, um, all that all that kind of fun stuff. That, that be, for some reason, I keep thinking of a sloth, like hanging up in the, uh, oh, yeah. in the, in the crow's nest. <laughs> it's, just be, yeah. it's something funny about it because they're so slow. So she could be like, come on down from there. And he's like, oh, I'm coming already. Yes. And then, like, uh, by the end of the show, he, he, they get down to the, the deck. Yeah, exactly. Uh, someone asked a question. Um, 
like the character we've talked about the team dynamic if the character is solo but uh, is constantly crossing paths with others uh, does that accomplish the same effect um, uh, yes and no um, interestingly enough when, on our first iteration of Nico uh, he was a solo hero who was um, uh, kind of off on adventures and that was absolutely our plan that we would encounter interesting people along the way uh, and that would sort of fill out the um, fill out the world, uh, and that and that ended up getting a lot of resistance from the broadcaster because they did feel like he needed sort of the team. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one drawback of having a character that that, that finds a team dynamic in other people is the lack of consistency. Um, so you you can it's possible to do a solo show, um, and I'm not saying don't don't pursue that if that's your thing. Um, it, but um, it's but yeah, yeah it, it, it is something to think about in terms of, again, if, if you have a character that is um, encountering new people in every episode, um, they almost have to explain everything, re-explain everything every time. Um, and so you get the sense of repetitiveness, perhaps. Um, yeah, there's something I found with, because like you say, with Nico originally, he was, you know, there was almost a Samurai Jack kind of element of it. You know, he was this lone mm -hmm. warrior that, and, and that was part of originally what we thought would create empathy for the character, that he was kind of all alone. But yeah, like you say, it kind of grew thin quite quickly in terms of like story potential. And almost by putting him with the other characters like Lyra, Le Princess Lyra and Mandor, you learn more about Nico. Right. That's the interesting thing, isn't it? It's like you you play him off like you say character conflict is huge and you play him off those characters and all of a sudden he became much more appealing right. and a more interesting character story story always comes from character and the more sort of characters that you can you can have to um that you can have to work with that that's you know i, th I think the better um there's a question um about how much of the concept should be completely fleshed out versus how much should be open to adaptation uh that's a really great question. Um, you have to have enough uh, to get people excited, but don't be, and then show your, your sort of vision and get them excited about it because that's what you're selling. But in the same time, you need to be flexible enough that if they say, well, we're already, there already is a show out that's going to be like this, or can you, can be this instead of that? You, you need to be able to, to, to be able to be flexible that way. Um, you know, and that, that can be sometimes frustrating when you have it all figured out that somebody wants something a little different and you're thinking, well, that's not my show. Well, um, at a certain point, it's, it's not going to be your show uh, anyways. You know, once it gets purchased or optioned, it's going to get developed. Other creative people are going to be brought in. Big changes are going to be made. Uh, so you're going to have to get used to the idea of have things happening with your baby that you know, it's going to turn it into possibly something else. Um, and, and in my experience, that's usually something better. Yeah. Something uh, you, you said before about like, you know, whatever you, great idea you have, you know, there's probably someone that's already done it. And it it's the more you flush it out, the more unique it's going to be naturally because you're going to come up with, you know, layers and layers of sort of the idea will get deeper and deeper as you flush it out. So the more you can, um, you know, the more uh, flushed out it is, the more unique it's going to be. And so probably the more likely it is that it'll stand right. out. Um, yeah. There's a question about uh, about character traits to assign each of the characters. Uh, and that, that that is all, you know, the idea about character development. And when you're looking at each character, it's like, what what's going to make them fun? What's going to make them interesting? What's going to give them a source of comedy? What's going to give them a source of fun that's going to make people enjoy seeing them? Um, uh, and, you know, what's going to make them original or un unique? There, there are really, if you think about it, no original characters. It's just sort of like how the combinations of them are. And that, that's sort of the thing about combinations. Um, you're almost going to cast this show. Like if you're creating an ensemble, what's going to give you, what's going to be something that, um, that that's going to give you a character that's going to tick all the different boxes within the team dynamic? You know, when, when we were developing Teen Titans, original Teen Titans, you know, we, we, we honestly were like looking at this like, okay, well, they're the breakfast club, you know, and, and we were sort of like, you've, you've got the, 
you've got the, 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 the peppy girl, you've got the goth, you've got the jock, you've got the smart kid, you know, you've got the type A kid, you know, or, or expanding that, you know, this, this one is the goth, this one is the foreign exchange student, you know, th this one's sort of the, you know, the type A guy, you know, this one is the, the class clown, this one's the jock, I, I bet you guys are fans of Titans can figure out who's who. Um, and, 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 and inevitably, you sort of find, you know, you sort of find the, the, the you know, that, that the way that the combination of people sort of works together. Um, Josh asked, what's the best way to break the ice in the beginning of a pitch? Um, that's a really great question. And when, if, if you've never had the opportunity to, to sit in a room with people you don't know, or people that you barely know to share an idea that you've been working on for months and sometimes years, it can be absolutely terrifying. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I do when I go in and pitch a show, um, most of the time, thankfully, there are people I know because I've been in the business for a while and I've made a lot of contacts and relationships. And so it, it's basically like I'm going to visit a friend but just often and not, uh, it's someone I don't know. Um, so the way I always approach it is by, I, I, just, I treat a pitch not as going in to sell a show, but going in to sell, to have a conversation. Um, and so that's the way you would do it. Breaking the ice is there's always gonna be small talk in the beginning of the pitch. And generally speaking, most development executives are really, really good at taking pitches um, and they, and they're also, I have to say to their credit, especially in animation, they're really, really good about putting people at ease. Um, so oftentimes it'll just be, Hey, tell me what you're working on, you know, and, and they'll often lead the conversation. So there is, uh, it's it, there, that, that icebreaker is absolutely essential to sort of putting you at ease, putting the buyer at ease getting everyone comfortable, and then you can go in to, to, to do your pitch. And the way that I was approach the verbal part of the pitch is that my objective is always to convince the person that I'm having a conversation with. And oftentimes it's not gonna be just one person in the room, it's gonna be several people, um, is to have a conversation with them, to get them, to try to sell them on being as excited about the idea as I am, and to demonstrate to them why I'm excited about what I'm excited about. So it's not just going and saying, here's the show, here's what it's about. It's, you know, putting some context into it. Like, for example, when, when I, I, if I were to go in and pitch this show, it might be, you know, when I was a kid, I used to always love pirate stories, Treasure Island, this, that, and the other. And when but when I look at all, you know, and, and I, you know, my kids love pirates and da, 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 da. it's like, well, and, and this is what I love about it. You know, I, I love sort of the adventures that are when I look at the shows that are out there, what I found was missing was, you know, it was too cliche or it was, you know, or, or it was, you know, I, I always felt that they were mean and I wanted to do something about pirates that actually helped people. Uh, and, and so I thought, wouldn't it be funny if, da, 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 da. so it all, it often comes down to, the idea of what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. Um, and and, what's, that, inter and what's interesting about that, Rob, is, is as I can say, you're sort of taking the, um, you know, the exec on, on a kind of a journey sort of into exactly. your idea, which is way more engaging than you just, um, people just reeling off, you know. Right. So concept. almost think back. And, and every pitch is going to be different because every story and every show is different. So try to think back to that moment of when you came up with that idea. And if you've just come up with the idea or if you haven't come up with the idea yet, remember it and write it down. The, the thoughts that go through your head, why you came up with the idea and what makes you love that idea so much. And remember that because mm. that's your way into the pitch. Yeah, and and the emotion, it, emotional connection. It, yeah. if, and that is true because, you know, there was a question that came up a, a little bit earlier in the scroll about, you know, should you think about the, you know, is this a toy? Is this a show that's going to sell toys? Well, if it's for a toy company, like let's say you're going to pitch a studio like Spin Master, um, which makes Paw Patrol and um, Rusty Rivets and, and a show called Abby Hatcher, which actually I created. 
Um, yes, uh, you, you are thinking about that. But the fact of the matter is increasingly no, because most of the shows are going to streaming. And for a lot of them, there really isn't a consumer products angle to it, simply because the sad reality nowadays is kids don't buy toys. Mm. It so is it, it is. And if you, if you're, if, if this is going to be a, um, you know, sort of a toy driven show, they may not be as excited about it uh, because really the, the new sort of idea, the new thing um, is quality of content. So, you know, the idea of, you know, this has to be good um, because that's what's selling a show. And that is awesome. It is so, it is so much, it's such a relief to me as someone that, that not only creates shows, but also takes shows that have already been sold and then develops them uh, into something that can be a TV show. Um, to know that, you know, there's not a great mandate, you know, a long time ago, you know, I can remember being in meetings where with toy companies where um, they were asking me um, to put Superman in a spacesuit because they needed that extra costume for it. And <laughs> having to explain that, well, you realize this is Superman, he doesn't need a spacesuit. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, so yeah, I mean, the fact is, is uh, the other aspect is, is that there is so much content on there right now. It is, it's mind boggling and you just can't do the same old, same old. It's gotta be different. It's gotta be interesting. Um, but again, sort of know your audience, you know, if, if, you know, if this is for a younger audience, it's, it's going to need to, it can't, it can be fun and interesting and strange and weird, but can't be too weird. Yeah. I think that's a big challenge actually is, is, is like we were saying earlier, because there's so much content out there. It's like, how do you um, come up with something unique these days? You know, when, when there is so much saturation with, with shows, but like you say, but, but then by setting out to come up with something specifically unique is not always the best way to start a show because you're kind of, like you're saying, you're missing out the character, you're missing out the, you know, the important stuff. Um, but, but to try and sort of start with a cliche and then keep pushing that until you find something really original seems to be a good way. Like, I guess like we're doing here, right? We're starting right. with the, the pirate theme right. and kind of trying to push it into make these characters original and different rather than, you know, we could have just had human kits and but that, right. that would have felt very generic. And, and so the other thing too, is that like, you know, we've, you know, we, we, this is a great place to start, but you know, the idea of being that, what about these images would then inspire you uh, and, and, and create sort of a, an engine for story. And, you know, I'm a, a writer, not an artist, but I, I will look at a drawing that, that an artist will do, or Jim and Adam might create, um, whether it's visual development, which I, I love looking at visual development for the purpose of that, you know, it, it excites your imagination or a character or something, a creature that maybe Jim's come up with and say, what, what is, what's the, what's the story here? I mean, I remember when I saw the motion comic for Nico for the first time and, you know, we, we went to the shrimp kingdom and I just, I love those characters so much. I'm like, I cannot wait to do an episode <laughs> where we get to meet these guys. Um, yeah. And, you know, that, that was just, you know, so it's, it's those sort of things, but, you know, take these things that we're working on here and then you, you refine. Okay. So Soupy looks a little bit like a bear. All right. Well, how, how can we make Soupy not look like a normal animal? You know, um, you know, uh, let's see, um, is, who's this, is this Blink uh, up on the crow's nest? Yeah. Yeah, so that that looks like a little bit like a sloth, but you know we've seen those types of characters before. So now, okay, how do we then take it into do something that makes it look like something we've never seen before? Maybe he's huh. a. Uh, right. Maybe he's like a, a striped. Maybe he's a wolverine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or or again, the idea is like, are we are we going to make them animals? Or are we going to make them creatures? You know, so that that mm. sort of you know yeah, that, that kind of becomes sort of the thing. It's like, you know, I, I like the idea of them look, you know, again, it's like the idea of Scorch came from the edges of the map and everyone thinks that Scorch is, um, is, a, is a parrot, you know, well, would we make, would the design make it look 
a little bit almost like it could be like Scorch is small enough to sit on Penny's shoulder and you know maybe it does have some more colorful you know scales that look like feathers. Um, it's almost enough like you people give these guys sort of a you know a second glance and it's like you don't look like normal people. Um, you know, there's something fun about the idea of a band of misfits that being, you know, everyone yeah. feels like they don't fit in, but here that here, here's a place where they all can belong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what kind of a creature would be the least suited for, for uh, sea travel? Yeah. Like, for what? Sea travel? Yeah. Like, like, are there animals that can't swim? Like, uh, like animals. A like cat hates sing? water. Like more a than cat. anything. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. The cat. I think salty should be a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Like one of those grumpy cats. Uh huh. Yeah, that, that could be really that, fun. that could be funny. And, um, and, and and she she or he would never leave the boat because she's terrified of water the whole time. Right. That's right. Yeah. Like the one that wants to make everyone walk the plank can't swim. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, this is a great example of sort of like the idea of like you know how we're an idea of we'll make it a cat. Okay, well, what's the characteristics of that? You know, cats don't like water, so it would, is it not funny that you have a pirate that basically spends their entire life on water um, and and not being able to um, you know or not wanting to go in? And of course, the comedy would inevitably that character falls in the scene. Right, yeah. every episode. At some yeah. point, <laughs> yeah, they should fall in. Right. But it can be as simple as that, right? Like I always remember um, in when I was growing up watching the A-Team and um, BA was afraid of flying. Right. And, and it's such a simple thing, but yet somehow that provided comedy in every single episode yeah. of the A-Team. I never got tired, you know? Especially with kids stuff, I think you yeah, can get- Yeah, kids, kids love, I mean, there, there is, you know, we, we look at things now, we see these, what, you know, executives will often call sort of repeatable elements. Um, you know, and, and like, because kids really love those and it's, it's mm. like the, the gear up sequence, you know, you mm. see in a lot of shows, whether it's, it's you know, that, that is sort of a standard and, and it's for a reason, mm. um, you know, character tropes where you would see, you know, a character, you know, the same thing happening over and over again, whether it's, it's salty falling in the water or it's, um, or it's uh, you know B. A. Barack is getting you know getting the the knockout pill so he can get on the airplane. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Do we want to? You guys are doing a great job there. Do we want to talk about the ship, or do we want to talk oh, about yeah. villains? Why don't we talk about the ship? Yeah, sure. The yeah. Ship. So every show, or I would say every show, you know, it's all, I like having shows where there's a home base. Um, and, and the reason being is that you always are going to have um, a, a home to come home to. Um, you know, I do a lot of team shows uh, and um, team shows often have a headquarters. Um, so I'm going to apologize also. I'm in the middle of my living room and I got a family of everyone running around in the background. So if you hear kids making a racket. That's my inspiration. Yeah, um, yeah the test uh, audiences. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, in Teen Titans, we had Titans Tower. It's sort of the clubhouse. It's the home base. Um, and, and I, and what better place than a, a pirate ship in this one? So in ours, it's called the Sea Beast. Um, and I was thinking it'd be fun that if it was like, again, the idea of not, um, being like a normal pirate ship, but the most amazing one ever. So if you're gonna make a show for kids, why not make this thing incredible? Um, so I, I, I love Miyazaki and so I'm saying, well, what if it's sort of like a Howl's Moving Castle where this thing has lots of hidden features that allow it to sort of tra almost transform and adapt. So it can sail on the sea, but you know, here's the other thing. We talk about portability. This is the home base, the clubhouse, that can go anywhere. But anywhere on a big, vast, wide open ocean means, well, what happens? You go to a different island. Oh boy, um, that's gonna get dull after a while. So what happens if this ship can also go on land? So let's imagine that it has legs that can pop out. It can, it can pretty much go anywhere. 
It's almost like a um, steampunk kind of shit. Right, like, so it could be, yeah. but steampunk more like piratey, like so winches yeah. and pulleys yeah. and, and ropes and 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 cranks and and that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's um, so you know, so yeah, if it wants to climb up a mountain, legs can come up. If it wants to go across the the land, maybe some kind of wheels can can come, like wagon wheels come out. Mm. You know, it'd be really um, fun as well is if um, uh, when the legs come out, one of the characters has to like sit on a like almost like a bike and ro uh, and cycle, and that's sure. what powers the legs. Yeah, that could yeah. be cool. Yeah. Um, you know, it could also they could seal it up, um, and it could go underwater. Um, however, I, I you know in thinking of you know possible you know again, this would make a toy, and and obviously you know that that's not a bad thing. Um, so if the toy were to have, um, accessories, like for example, maybe it has, you know, uh, most boats have a tender or, you know, a small sort of rowboat that goes up. So maybe they have one too, but this one can, maybe that can turn into a submarine. Maybe that can also turn into a hot air balloon. Um, yeah. to kind of give it some, some extra, extra portability. Yeah, I, I love the idea too that maybe this this vessel almost has a mind of its own, uh, as if it's a, a sort of a character unto itself. Um, if this came for, with Penny from the area beyond the map, uh, there could be a little bit of sort of magic in that. Um, yeah, that sounds awesome. Like almost a bit like um, Knight Rider, like the uh, the boats. Yeah. It, it doesn't talk, but it yeah. does sort of have its own personality. Um, you know, so for example, you know, you have a, you know, salty first mate wants to try to steer the ship. Uh, it never goes where it wants it to go. Yeah. But all Penny has to do is point at her map and say, let's go here. And the ship, you know, turns and takes them there. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, and, and maybe it like it's a bit disobedient so like a dog you know you tell it to stay and then it starts wandering off and right <laughs> they come back and the ship's like you have gone to go or find the ship yeah, yeah yeah again it's just creating those potential for conflict isn't it for yeah absolutely stories. um just everyone so you know i mean i i am seeing your your questions roll through um uh, and we'll we're going to spend a lot of, we'll save a lot of time at the end to to answer those especially sort of the more sort of nuts and bolts business question. Like I said, I am able to, I am sort of seeing some of these and I'll, I'll answer some as they, if I can catch them, but things are scrolling through pretty pretty fast. So um, uh, not ignoring you, just know that we'll we'll try to get to all your questions um, at, at, you know, either towards the end or, or, or at some point. Um, yeah, so, you know, the idea of having a, a sort of a home base and uh, is, is always sort of good in your show, like where do they live, what, what, you know, what's that look like? The other part of that is utility. Um, animation is a business. Animation operates on a budget. Uh, budgets are there for a reason. Uh, and there are lots of things that affect the budget. And one of the main things that affects the budget is locations. And the less, the more locations you have, the more you have to design, the more you have to color, uh, the more crew you need, and the more expensive your show costs. More money, so, more problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in a perfect world, you'd be able to go anywhere at any time. Um, but you want to try to limit the amount of sets that you have in your show. Um, and so having a, a location or locations that you can set a lot of the action is always going to be a good thing to think about. Um, don't let that get in the way of a good idea, uh, but, you know, especially if you have a series like this one could conceivably be where you are spanning the globe, conceivably seeing a new location in every episode, you need to be able to balance that. Um, this is especially going to be a factor if your show is CG. Um, it's a lot easier to draw a new quick background in uh, a, a traditional 2D show, just simply because you're literally drawing it. And that, that, you know, background can be done in a day. Um, incidental character could be done in a day. Um, but when you're doing CG, you know, that it's, now it has to be designed, it has to be modeled, it has to be colored, it has to be textured, it has to be rendered, it has all those different, the, the, the production pipeline becomes massive. 
um, and it, it changes things considerably. Um, so, every do you want to talk about bad guys? Uh, yeah. We yeah. still want to work on the ship a little more. Um, um, yeah, that, I mean, it feels like we've covered like a lot of the aspects of the ship, especially bring, giving him a little personality. I think it's awesome. yeah. Yeah, I just got to run to the washroom. We'll be right back. We'll step back. Okay. So um, we'll we'll talk. You know, every show needs to have conflict, and conflict can come from situations, right? You know, it can be you know, uh, you know, oh no, um, you know, <coughs> Soupy's hit the sauce again. Uh, <coughs> not the, the sauce, but you know. <laughs> The sea sauce. Sea sauce. <laughs> um, uh, but but it also can come from uh, you know the villain, um, and so it's always going to be fun, especially in an adventure show, to have some sort of bad guy or get bad guys. Um, and now, how important is it, Rob, to have like you know the same bad guy every week? Because obviously that was something in cartoons we grew up with. You know, it was always. You know, He-Man versus Skeletor, and, right. and but but nowadays um, it seems different. It's it, I, I you know there's a certain thing that I, I call it villain fatigue, mm -hmm. and and you get that when you have the same bad guy over and over again. And honestly, yeah. that, that it came from that. You know, it was it was the idea of seeing, you know, uh, the same villain with the same henchman in yeah. every single story. Yeah. Um, and what it ends up meaning is that, you know, you know, ah, curse is foiled again. You know, you yeah. have the, the bad guy that is always basically an idiot because <laughs> they can't achieve any of their goals. Yeah. Um, and, and almost in a sense makes you root for the bad guy more than the hero because you yeah. finally want to see and then but but of course, how do you how do you justify a villain that can't ever get it right? And so you have to make them an idiot. You have to make them just basically a comic, you know, a, a comic foil for, for the hero. Um, and, and that can be fun, especially for a little kid. But the fact of the matter is, is we are not little kids making a show. We're grown ups making a show. And we want it to be interesting and fun for us. So we want more interesting and complex and nuanced characters, even if they're comedically based. You still want them to be fun. So, um, I, I am always more of a fan of having a rogues gallery of villains instead of one singular one. Mm. That way, every episode can sort of be you can you can you can find a different villain, uh, and that way you know maybe some you don't see the villain or villain, and then you know a couple episodes later you do, and then the audience isn't tired of them and say, oh great, you know. Um, so. <laughs> Also, yeah. with this show, you get the sense they're always going to be moving, right? Like through, right. you know, through through this kind of uh, adventurous world, ocean, whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, to kind of come across different characters all the time and maybe revisit one or two feels feels like it would suit this better. Mm -hmm. So would we th would we think of the villains in this show as sort of like real pirates, like typical pirates? Say that again, Jim. Would we think of the pirates in this show as, say, like regular pirates, like lying, cheating, stealing type pirates, or do we want them to be sort of like, mon are the monsters the villains, or are the monsters sort of the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the obstacle? Um, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think the idea is that you can have. I mean. The nice thing about, you know, villains is they have motivation, and you know, and and that and that is sort of the um, is sort of the locus of of, of story. Um, I kind of like the idea of um, them coming across a situation which might have been caused by a villain. Maybe they come across, um, let's say, a kraken, you know, that has mm -hmm. been hurt and needs help, and and so. The villain might have been the thing that hurt the kraken and you know they they kind of end up facing the villain like later right. on but it's it's not almost like the driving force of the show it's almost well, like that's that that's a great point and that's also sort of we talk about like a good story driver and that is um if you look at you know any sort of you know whether it's paw patrol uh, as sort of a, 
more peaceful example, or even um, you know Thunderbirds, which is a, a show I, I recently wrapped. Um, it wasn't necessarily about bad guys and stopping a bad guy. It's it's about dealing with a problem and dealing with a consequence. Um, so yeah, that's sort of like you know using a villain as sort of the as sort of the instigator of a circumstance that then our heroes have to deal with is always going to be a, a, a better way to um, approach things in a show like this, what we're doing here, simply because that be, otherwise what you have is like a chase scene and a fight. Mm. Um, and when you're making a show for younger kids, um, you don't want fight scenes. They just, they're not going to be there. Uh, so what else do you have to do? So now you have problem solving. Um, and, and that I think is a much better way in that's going to, that's going to make a buyer, um, uh, a little more interested in, in what, uh, you know, what you're doing. And that also sort of talks about the, um, you know, when you, when you talk about like, okay, here's the concept I have for a show. Um, oh, <laughs> um, you know, Okay, so give me an idea of an episode, and you know we might talk about that in a little bit. Um, but the idea of having, you know, circumstances, consequences, and then what what is our what are our characters going to be doing um, every episode, and and that sort of ties into the idea of, you know, what makes this character a different kind of pirate. Well, she doesn't steal; she gives. She doesn't hurt; she helps. Um, and so what are opportunities where she can help people that need help? What are circumstances where she can give people things that they need because it's either been taken from them by someone else or it's been destroyed by someone else. Mm. Um, so that, that kind of becomes, um, you know, a big part of it. Um, so, uh, one of the things that, I mean, a lot of, shows in this age range you know they, they they usually have some sort of um element where kids are learning something and and this doesn't seem like the type of show where you would want to have like like a, a almost like a curriculum to it but correct um my favorite shows that uh my son watches who's four are the ones that are kind of like you're learning about animals but it's in an, in an entertaining way be, um because they're sort of like an endless amount of uh, cool things about animals that, um, e like, even I didn't know. Like, there's all these, like, crazy, uh, you know, little interesting facts. Like, that could be something about this show that would be cool. Like, maybe the, you know, one of the characters is, like, you know, a polar bear, and it's, like, he's, you know, she rescued him, you know, from, like, <laughs> I don't know, like, from, like, uh, so some iceberg that was melting or something or like you know like the crab if there's a crab character you know you might learn that crabs when they get their arms cut off they can grow them back or you know whatever like some little like tidbit of information that might be kind of cool sure absolutely and you know it also can be just as simple as modeling good behavior you know it's sort of like this is you know just being empathetic to the needs of others um you know, good versus evil, right versus wrong is, is, is pretty universal. Um, and, you know, look, if, if, you, if you had an opportunity to pitch to someone that was looking for a curriculum component, mm. you would absolutely find a way to put one in. Mm. Um, and, but chances are you're, you're, you're not. Um, it's more of like, well, what, what is sort of the, 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 the sort of the upside in terms of a moral compass for this? Um, but I just think, you know, the idea of, you know, helping people being, you know, kind to others, um, seeing the consequences when you're not, uh, that I think is, is, is enough to sort of hang your, your pirate hat on. Yeah. Um, someone pointed out that uh, in, in the chat about sometimes that you don't, you know, a villain doesn't actually need to be a person. And that is absolutely true. Um, you know, you know, nature can be its own, uh, you know, its own conflict. Um, you know, they could be in traveling to the eye of a storm. Um, the, they, uh, so they're, in terms of giving them something to do and giving them something to sort of, you know, work 
in opposition to, um, that can be a, a perfectly valid way to go. Um, the downside is, of course, is that tropical storms, you know, don't have witty one-liners. Hmm. Um, and the other aspect- Well, maybe in Asia they could. Well, they could. <laughs> uh, the other thing too, is you gotta be really careful um, is that when you are dealing with sort of forces of nature, um, literally um, that sometimes can get a little too close to home. You know, I mean, yeah. I'm here in Los Angeles and I can barely see across my street, the smoke is so thick from the forest fires nearby. You know, lives are ruined by floods and storms every year. Um, so, you know, you know, we gotta be careful that you don't, you know, even though you're doing it in a fun way, um, th that, that can sometimes be, you know, a thing to look out for. I did a Thunderbirds episode about a building, a skyscraper on fire. And even though we did it in a way that was fun and exciting and no one got even close to ever being hurt, it just so happens the episode was gonna come out right at the same time there was a massive apartment block fire in London where the show was made uh, and we had to pull it from the air. Uh, yeah. Just because it was, you know, for kids, these little things can be kind of traumatic, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, it, I think it's nice to kind of focus on, you know, more small scale problems, but then in, in this adventurous world, like they could come across a whale that has um, something stuck in its teeth, you know, like it's still it's still a big problem in, in that moment but it's much more kind of in in the land of adventure rather than like you say hitting these kind of real real problems and then that way you avoid all those, all those right. issues. um connie has a good question or what if the villain is more about problems such as someone's store closing because of bankruptcy well that that is a bit of a um a sophisticated concept for a little kid but i actually think that's a really good thing to point out. And, and that speaks less about what a villain could be, but more about what a story driver is and about someone helping. And that is, is that, you know, um, while you wouldn't necessarily approach it from a, like the, that sort of a financial aspect, the idea, kids can understand the idea of a store closing uh, or, or, or someone's, you know, the same thing that someone does. Um, you know, it's a um, bad example fishermen and there's no more fish or the, the person that makes um you know that uh, but and, and, that, and that giving our characters something to do to help someone um it's it's a real life circumstance um perhaps that was caused by a villain who knows maybe not but the idea of there's all sorts of different ways that you can find to have your characters be able to help people and what you'll find is that when you have your characters all fleshed out in your team, stories just sort of come. It's like, where, let's say they go to a place. What happens there? What do they find? What's a circumstance that they would need to, to help someone? Well, it could be, you know, the, sh the, the shopkeeper is, you know, been run out of business and, and or, you know, no one's buying periscopes anymore. So, you know, maybe Penny and her team comes up with a way to make them cool again. Who knows? Yeah, that's interesting, actually, because one of the big things I've noticed about, you know, the whole this recent pandemic is that it's it's created a lot of need for, for people to adapt. You know, it's mm -hmm. like the old way isn't working anymore. So it's like taking what we have, how can we adapt and make this new situation work? And that can be something that they that they are able to achieve is figuring out how to help that person adapt to then, you know, to continue be a, to, to be successful. An evil right. pandemic where all yeah. these pandas oh. are a pandemic. Yeah. yeah, I don't yeah. know if there's gonna be any pandemic jokes. Uh, <laughs> no. and, you know, yeah. you know no. again, we talk about hitting too close to home. You know, yeah, exactly. of, um, well, let's talk about villains. I, I kind of thumbnailed the, the ideas for a whole bunch of them because things I thought were funny. So mm -hmm. I, I thought of a guy named No Beard because you know pirates always have the mangy beards and he's always up, up to look out for treasure to squirrel away. So who knows? Maybe he's an actual squirrel. But one of the things oh. about No Beard, he's sort of like the main. Um, sort of adversary for Penny. And he really covets that unusual bird that she has more than anything. And so he's always trying to steal Scorch. Uh, of course, not realizing that he's a dragon. Uh, but anytime Scorch tries to grab, uh, or Nobeard tries to grab Scorch, uh, Scorch always, because he's got not a full dragon's fire, but just a little bit of a cough of sparks. And he always singes off his beard. Um, 
and you know, it's kind of a dum dum, so it hasn't really been able to figure out to, that scorch is sort of the cause of this. Um, so I, I thought that that could be funny about you know having the pirate who's you know always trying to be the most piratey, uh, but yeah, uh, Penny great. and her team always sort of get in get in the way of that. Um, uh, I come up, came up with a character named Bella Bolton and her crew about, aboard the Ladybug, um, but they're more like Mean Girls than actual pirates. Um, oh, that's cool. So I thought it could be funny. Um, I thought of a, a villain named Itchy and the Sand Fleas, uh, and they're in a boat called the Tipping Tub. And you, if you see their ship on the horizon, you know, sail away fast or they'll swarm on board. Uh, eat every scrap of food you have in the galley and use all your clean towels, you know, so just sort of like, you know, there's a sort of swarm of things that that, um, uh, that would be kind of fun. Yeah. Um, I, I like the Idor idea of a sort of a Viking inspired villain named uh, uh, Igor Iceberg, but he says everything funny like Igor Eastborg, um, <laughs> you know, nobody listens to him and drives him bananas. They call it bananas. Um, he sells a Viking ship, wears a pointy Viking hat, but he's definitely not an actual Viking. Um, that, that could be kind of funny. And no yeah. weird guy could have this like George Washington hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like he could, uh, he's always trying to look mean and stuff, but he can never really pull it off because he doesn't have a beard. So he's <laughs> really angry about that. And he always looks adorable, and that really drives <laughs> me nuts. Yeah, that's pretty. Um, yeah. So, but you know, the villains—the thing is that you can come up with a new one. All you know, like if you're if you're in a if you're in a situation where uh, you know you, you need someone, create them. But the idea of with a pitch, you you want to be able to say, okay, here are the bad guys. You know, here, here are the people that are going to give sort of the comic foil and, and you can sort of flesh out their characters enough to give everyone sort of a sense um, of, you kind of give them a sense of who they're going to be up against in every episode. Um, it's been asked, I think, in the, in the chat so far, but I'll also point out that it's always going to be a good idea to have um, a couple of sample episodes in mind, you know, what, what could be a typical episode? Um, because here's the thing, I mean, in the, in, in the olden days, you would, um, you would actually go in and do a verbal pitch and there's still opportunities for that. Um, but you know, now that everything's sort of virtual and probably are going to be for a little while, that's going to change the dynamics of, of how a pitch is going to work, and so my suspicion—I I, I, actually—I haven't pitched anything post COVID, so I, I can't say this for sure. Um, but chances are, it's going to be sending stuff over, um, and that's going to mean whether it's a written pitch document or it's uh, you know something with some artwork uh, that they can kind of get a sense of. Um, and then if they, if, if your buyer sort of responds to it, it might follow up with a, a further conversation where you could really dig in a little deeper. Um, See, that's, that's an interesting point, Rob, because we, you know, yeah, we've done a few pitches um, in the last few months and um, they've, often they've asked for us to send over material beforehand. And we've actually um, said, actually, we'd rather, you know, pitch it to you um, in person just because, and that, that's something, you know, that's just our, you know the way we, mm -hmm. we were doing it but is there is there value to the first time these guys see your idea that that they hear it you know from your perspective or is it actually better to almost give them something and let them use their imagination to bring it to life you know, well it kind of depends i mean if you're new at pitching and you can put together a really great presentation that might actually be to your advantage um mm -hmm. You know, because if you're stumbling through a pitch, you know, with lots of ums and ahs and awkward pauses and um, which happens, happens to me all the time. Even now, I've been doing this for a long time and I've gone in and just totally blown pitches. Um, you know, that's no fun. 
Uh, but it happens, uh, you know, that, that might be a way to sort of eliminate that possibility. There is, I have to say there is a, there's nothing better than being able to, um, nothing better than to be able to sort of get excited about someone else's enthusiasm. Um, and I have always firmly believed that when you're pitching a show, you're not pitching the idea, you're pitching yourself. Yeah. Um, and it's really, really hard to do that with a four page, you know, pitch document PDF that you email over. Then again, you know, um, so a pitch over Zoom where you're sheet screen, scare, sh screen sharing and flipping through your cards in a PowerPoint deck is, is not going to, um, it's not going to give that same impact either. So I don't know, maybe we wait till things get better to start pitching shows or we figure out a way to, to make it happen. You know, if, if you already have a longstanding relationship with the person you're pitching to, it certainly helps. But for the most part, I would guess that most of the people that are watching this uh, are going to be looking for a way in uh, and maybe are either new to pitching or just in the beginning parts of their career. Uh, and, you know, maybe don't have as easy access. And so maybe they got their foot in the door, but they don't quite have the relationships yet. Um, but, you know, they do say a picture says a thousand words and, and seeing even just a one pager um, sometimes can be enough. And, and that's where I think um, is, you know, where um, I'm still assuming most of you out there are artists, not just non-drawers non like myself. Um, the fact that you have art uh, is a huge advantage. However, I should also point out, if there are any non-artists watching, um, every show I've sold has been a pitch document that's literally words on a page. Um, and it, it's come without art. So a good story is a good story. and if you can create, evoke those images in the head of the person you're pitching to without pictures, um, with a good story, it, it can happen. Art helps though. Um, I, I always get the question, um, you know, do you need, you know, do you need words with your pitch or do you, it, or it's just words, do you need art? Um, it's sort of yes and no. Um, you know, do, you know, art always helps, uh, but it's not always necessary. I would say that if you're an artist and you have a specific style and you're known for that style, and that is the thing that you're bringing to it, then yes, absolutely, that's going to be your biggest selling point, I think. Um, but while you can certainly get someone excited about a one page, one sheet, um, you know, that, that sort of key art, um, and we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Um, if there's not much meat to back that up in terms of story, it may not go very far. Um, so you do sort of have to have the, um, you do have to have some things figured out. Um, and I, I am starting to see a lot of questions about the, the mechanics about how long pitch should be, how you get in, all that kind of stuff. I promise I will get to those. Uh, I just want to sort of let, let us get through the art and stuff first. Um, uh, what about in terms of how much, uh, Rob? Because like, you know, we've, we've in the past, we've made the mistake of, well, I say mistake, we've, we've put like 40 page PDFs together, you know, like, so in a sense, overloading. Um, with that's too much for a pitch. Yeah, um, yeah. I think three or four pages, you just want to have just enough to get someone, your, your buyer excited about it and they want to learn more. Now, if you have, if you figured all that other stuff out, that's great, but keep that in your back pocket. And, and yeah. if they keep saying, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more, they will. So if you can keep this to like, like when I'm doing a written pitch, it's usually maybe two pages of just text. If it's a pitch with visuals, three or four pages, maybe is all you need. Like you would have like a key art on the front and then the next two pages might be talking about the characters, the world, some sample stories, and then your back page would be, you know, much more thinking. Maybe, you know, some of the great visual 
pitches I've seen have been key art on the front. So the one picture that this is your elevator pitch visually, the thing that, that sells it with like, oh my God, I totally get this show. I think it's hilarious. You know, title of the show, characters, world, situation, ideally in color. Um, it, it's, it's the movie poster version, right? Um, then on the inside, you might have an introduction to the characters. And this could be character ske pencil sketches. Show them in lots of different poses, lots of different expressions. Remember, you're, you're selling an animated series. You're not selling a comic book. So just static, not stills that aren't coming alive, aren't going to help you. Make them look, give them some life. Um, you know, pushed, exaggerated poses even. Um, but again, pencil sketches, keep it rough. Uh, or maybe one full color and then the rest are just figure sketches. Um, talking about your heroes, your team, your villains, you know, the world, what it takes, where it takes place, and maybe a couple of sample idea, ideas for sample stories. That's all you need. Um, it, it, and if I think that if you can't, if, if, you know, you need at least that much to sell it, but any more than that, I think you've overthought it. Mm. Um, because, you know, this did come up earlier in questions, uh, and, and also we touched on a little bit, you need to have, um, you need to have room for uh, development. Uh, that's the word you're going to love to hate. Because um, generally what will happen is you'll come in and you'll pitch a show, especially if you've never run a show before. Um, you will come in, you'll pitch a show, they'll love the concept, they'll love the design, they'll love the art, they'll love the, and then what they'll do is they'll hire someone like me to come in and then turn it into a series. Um, you know, I'll write a show Bible, um, I'll write a pilot script, uh, I'll write, you know, backup stories, uh, either myself or, or some writers. Um, the, the, the sad reality is, um, you'll be lucky to be involved in the show that you create, unless you're already a bona fide showrunner already. Um, and that's just sort of the, the way it is. Um, especially if, if now there is some really sort of some um, exceptions to this. Um, I mean, I'll use Nico for an example, um, you know, it was created by Jim and Adam and Bobby and Kay based on the motion comic that they did. And all of them already had a background in animation. So they you know, were able to sort of bring something to the table. Jim specifically was our series lead uh, character designer um, because we needed to hire a character designer and who better than Jim? <laughs> um, you know, um, Adam was hugely important in the storyboard stage, you know, in, in sort of participating, giving notes in that. Um, and so that, that sort of was a lucky situation. Um, you know, that often is not uh, the, that's not often the case. Um, yeah, I, th I think, I think uh, young creators, you know, cause you know, we, we, that was our first show. And I think a lot of young creators, you, you see that whole, um, uh, you know, the, the title card created by, um, i trying to think of examples, like um, uh, the guy who did Powerpuff Girls. Um, ah, no, yeah, yeah. You know, you see that and you kind of think, and then you get you get the impression that he's literally like running, directing the whole thing. You know, you don't really realize that saying created by doesn't necessarily mean you had huge involvement, like you're saying, in the whole thing. So so I think a lot of people kind of get that impression when you when you see that created by is often the first credit you see. And you get the sense that like, you know, if I sell a show, I'm literally going to be like, you know, directing it, like to, making all the decisions, but it's really a huge collaborative effort. And, right. and you've, got, you've got to put a lot of trust and faith in your team. And, and that was something, you know, we really had to, had to um, understand ourselves and, and, and the whole project was so much better for that. But, mm -hmm. you know, there is a natural tendency, I think when you've created something and it almost always it, it's your baby. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and like you say, it's really important to, to, to be able to let it go to some degree. Yeah. And, you know, and honestly, and that's something too, that, you know, I, I always, you know, I'm, I'm in many ways, you know, sometimes I'll create and sell shows and sometimes I'm a hired gun more mm -hmm. often than not, I'm a hired gun. And, you know, it's my job usually to take someone else's idea, whether it's something that 
can, that you know, but oftentimes from another format, whether it's a motion comic or a comic book or an old TV show. And a huge part of my job is being mindful and respectful of the source material and also the people that created that source material. And it, it can never be sort of like, it's mine now, you know, it has to be um, as much of a collaborative effort given, you know, you, as you can in the circumstances. Um, at, you know, location has a, a lot to do with it. You know, if, if you don't live in the same town in which the show is being made, that is definitely a disadvantage. However, nowadays all shows are getting done virtually anyways. So that kind of doesn't matter as much anymore. Um, you know, we talk about access. You know, if you're a storyboard artist at Cartoon Network um, and you're working on a show, uh, you, you have access because you are already inside. And, 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 you know, if you think about like where all of the great, you know, shows on Cartoon Network nowadays are coming from, the new original series, they come from creators that were board artists on other shows. You know, yeah. They're coming off Adventure Time. They're coming off a regular show. You know, they're, 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 they're coming off these series and, and they're, you know, they have an opportunity, they have access and opportunity and they pitch um, and they're that sort of open the door policy. That, that's not as easy. Um, there's, that's not as easy when, um, you know, when you're outside the system. So I'm seeing a lot of questions here about how an artist can be a creator of a show and be the showrunner. Um, that would be, you know, the ultimate goal. Um, well, here's a, uh, I mean, Jim and Adam, you guys are a great example of how, how that would work. Um, well, don't you need to know a lot about writing to be a showrunner? Isn't it Not mostly... necessarily. And here's, here's the thing is that I, I have to say, I, I, I really hate the, the term showrunner as it applies to animation. Um, I, I get called that a lot in my, in my capacities because I'm sort of, not only I'm the head writer, but I'm also the head producer and sort of overseeing the entire sort of vision of the series. And there'll be directors and board artists now that working under me, although my, my goal is always to start to stay out of their way and let them do their things. But animation is such a hugely collaborative job. It doesn't take just one artist or one writer to do everything. Um, it does help to have one person's vision. Oftentimes that's an artist, sometimes it's a writer, sometimes it's a team of them. Um, but like, for example, Jim and Adam, you know, they co-created the, the material that Nico was based on. They came in, they weren't the showrunners of Nico. Um, I was lucky enough to do that, but they also have that behind their belts now. And now they're going out pitching a lot of shows and there's a real good chance that on the next one they sell, they will be. It's a really interesting one because, because having done that experience, you know, we sort of, there's, there is, there is some benefit to, to, to having distance from the project, you know, because obviously like Rob, you, you yourself are working closely with Titmouse. Um, I, were you in the studio uh, five days a week? Uh, pretty um, much? Most of the time. Was, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so, and, and obviously you guys are all kind of like, you know, in that, and, and you're, you're the one having to like, actually physically produce this show, right? And it's almost like me and Jim, if we were there, I sometimes think we would have got too um, tunnel vision into what we we're doing rather than sitting back and seeing it as a whole. There's, there's some benefit to that, that I wonder if, if we did um, we successfully sell another show that we would actually choose to actually do that again, essentially, like work with someone experienced like yourself, because we learned so much from that. that. What do you think, Jim? I think I learned, uh, the biggest thing I learned was like how little I would know about show running. Like, like yeah. how much, you know, how much uh, you really do need to know about writing and, and structuring TV episodes so that you can sort of, you know, just listening to you, Rob, like, you know, riffing on like, you know, what's going to happen in an episode or what, where could they go or who could they see and, and, and just you know being able to come up with that stuff like just boom 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 and, and and you have to have a certain speed of it like i think if i was to do a sh like run a show and be in charge of the writing of it it might take 20 years to make the show <laughs> well it definitely you definitely have help um but you know that's an interesting thing too if you think about it you know if i was an artist i'd be like this i'd be hunkered down i would be looking at that little thing in front of me um, and the difference between that 
between that little image on a page, which can explode into ideas galore, you know, showrunner is everything. I mean, you are, you're talking about the, 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 the this is starting from a, 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 an episode. And I, let's say our show is sold. Here, here's an example of stuff I would do. Visual development, coming up with how the world looks. I don't actually draw that, but I, I work with concept artists and character designers to, to find to find the, the characters that look right and the world that looks right. Let's make it more like that. Let's make it more like that. What do you think of this? Is this cohesive with the idea for the show? All right, now we're talking about story ideas. Well, you got to come up with like a log line for an episode. And then that turns into an outline, which turns into many iterations of a script. Well, that's got to go to the network and they got to give notes and you got to interact with the network to, to, to argue things that you think is you don't agree with. Um, the script goes to the voice recording. Then you got to, you know, so you've got to be there to supervise the voice director and the cast as they record the episode. Then it goes to storyboard. I'm not drawing the storyboard panels, but the directors and the supervising storyboard artists are, are taking care of that. But I got to look at the storyboards to make sure they're tracking the script and that we're not missing the opportunities and that it makes sense. Then I got to sit there when the animatics being edited. Um, you know, is the story tracking? It's all about, is the story tracking? Is it looking good? Then that goes into animation. I look at dailies, are the shots right? Again, series director is going to cover most of that, but I get to see it when it's all assembled. Um, finally, animation is done. Well, what happens next? I got to sit in a room with the sound designer and, and, and spot sound effects. Then I have to sit in the room with the, the, the composer and, and spot the, the music. And then I got to listen to reviews of the music and the sound effects. Then it's got to go into the mix and I got to listen to the mix. Then it's got to go into color grade and I got to sit there with the, with the, with the, um, with the colorist to make sure the actual show actually looks good. Um, so it's, it's, it, you, you start with a, a little drawing that creates a show and then you realize that it's a lot of stuff to do. Mm, yeah. um, um, and so you sort of have to have, you have to know enough about a lot of different things but also know enough to let the people do their jobs, but at least be there as sort of like the safety check, all about like, is, is this executing the vision of the show um, that, we're, that, that we signed up for? And so, so that's what a showrunner has to be able to, to do. And so if you think about it, going from, I've got a great idea and it is a great idea and you sell it to being that person, um, some people can do it, um, but the question is, will a studio that's going to spend $20 million, that's $20 million on a, ser on a season of episodes, um, maybe 10, depending if it's low budge, uh, are they going to entrust you to a multi-million dollar business, basically? Um, it scares me when I think about it, but you know the idea is that there's a lot of other people around you. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, long story short, you know, expect, you know, for your first maybe couple shows you sell, um, for your involvement to start off small and then expand, you know, because eventually, you know, you sell the show and it becomes a hit. Um, other people are going to want you, your ideas, and then you're going to get more and more access, more and more people interested in you, um, more and more opportunities. Who knows? Maybe you'll get a, a, a housekeeping deal or an overall deal at a studio. It happens. Um, yeah, I think you know you, you kind of there's no kind of formula for it. You kind of you go in with what you got, and I think if you've if you've if you've shown them something that they want to buy, they <clears throat> most of the time. I, I mean, I would hope that they would want your input on, you know, this show. Um, you know, the thing that makes it unique is 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 the thing that you would be selling. So, right. You know, hopefully they would uh, they would want to cap. You know, have that insight, mm -hmm. and then uh, you kind of. I mean. You learn so much just like the whole process is and, and you know there's a difference between like me selling a show i'm just a writer i just have ideas and all of you most of you out there who are artists and like jim and adam is that you're selling a vision that is literally a vision um 
so the, the 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 style and the art comes to comes from it too. That's why you see more often than not shows that are on TV are are, are that are so certainly there are board driven shows that are created by artists and storyboard artists because mm -hmm. they're selling cartoons in their purest form. Um, I'm always going to have to have a Jim and Adam as the next step in my process. Um, the advantage you have is, you know, you can start with the visuals and if you're a great writer, then you've got a made, but you also have the ability to bring in a writer. So that comes to the next sort of idea of what about collaborating? Well, if you're, if you're a, if you've got the idea for a show and it's got the visuals and you have a really interesting perspective, but maybe you need help with story, think about collaborating. Because there's a lot of great writers out there that can't draw that are looking to team up. Um, let's say you you have all of that, all of the above, but maybe don't have access. Um, maybe you know. Let's say you're working on a show as a as a background painter or a character designer or or even just you're you make you know web comics or whatever you're doing to get yourself started. Uh, but you know some writers or story editors. Team up because they may have the access that you need to get yourself in the room to pitch. Um, there's no, there's nothing wrong at all with collaborating. Um, oh, and people are asking if it's going to be available later. Yes, I believe this stream is going to be, you can come back and watch the whole thing. Yeah. Is that right, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, and good luck on your portfolio review. Um, Nicholas, uh, good luck. Um, uh, people have asked about what's going to happen when you sell your show. Um, so we, we can sort of kind of get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts here now. Um, what will happen is uh, a network or a studio will option your idea, which basically means they'll give you a very small amount of money, probably a thousand bucks. Uh, to have the option to develop and uh, this show for a set amount of time, usually a year, and then they have an automatic option to re uh, the, they have the option to renew that for say another twelve months, uh, usually for the same amount of money, sometimes a little bit more, and then they probably have a third option which they can renew it again. And usually, what happens is they uh, they'll they'll pay a little more. So it might be let's say you get two thousand bucks for the option. For the first year, they renew it again. You get another two thousand bucks, and if the third year it still hasn't been greenlit yet, they might give you five grand. This is sake of example. Um, what you're giving them for that option is the right to develop the show, uh, and then you're also set. You're also um, usually setting a sales price. So they'll give you a thousand dollars to option the show, and then you get, uh, and then you decide. Okay, and then we will. Purchase the, we have the option to purchase the rights from you, uh, and we'll give you $20,000. That's just a number, but that's not too far off from what it would be. Not a lot of money, but that's kind of about where that is. Um, and then you would get, in addition to that, an episodic royalty. Let's just say you're not involved in the show at all. Okay, you're not doing anything. Uh, you would have a created by credit. Um, maybe if you're lucky, you would get a producer credit um, if you're like reviewing things and looking, but not guaranteed. Um, and then you would get a, a per episode royalty. So for every episode they make, they might give you 3,000 bucks, you know, depends on the show. Um, then you would have, if you're lucky, uh, most cases creators would negotiate um, some sort of back end. So it might be three percent, two and a half percent of whatever you know proceeds they get from toy sales and merchandise and that kind of stuff. Um, so if it's a big, huge toy hit, um, it would uh, you would get you know you might see some money, you might not. Um, if you were to also render actual services on the show, um, you would be paid on top. So that would be, let's say, you know, I wrote, I created the show, um, but I also am going to be the story editor. I would negotiate that separately. Uh, so there is a way to sort of, you know, it, it seems a little disheartening 
disheartening to know that you could create and sell a show that could be a big hit and you're not going to get rich. Um, but, you know, at some point it, it's going to turn into a pretty decent job. Um, the other thing we should, we should um, mention is that it's worth um, at that point finding, uh, you know, a lawyer or someone who understands, you know, the, the media business to right. solve because, um, you know, we made mistakes with our contracts, um, you know, that we didn't think of things that, you know, someone experienced would have just been like, oh yeah, you have to put this in there. Yeah. And then well, as soon as you um, signed it, it's it, right? It's right. too late. <laughs> if, if, you, if you don't have an agent or a manager, and a lot of people don't starting off, uh, and yes, we'll get to the do you need an agent or manager question here too in a second. Um, yeah. If you don't, uh, it, it, it's wrong. I would, I would absolutely say it's essential to get a lawyer to help you negotiate the, the sales contract or the option for, um, for your show. Um, it's, yeah, it's just, you know, otherwise the studio is going to send you boilerplate and it's always going to be to their advantage, not to yours. Yeah. Um, you naturally, you're so excited, I think, but you know, oh my God, yeah. you know, we sold the show and you, you literally just sign it. You don't even really sort of consider that, you know, you can get a, a better deal or, or there's certain things that you might have missed in the, you know, in the long run. Right. Um, Amy's asking about um, if you're already a storyboard artist and pitching to studios you work for, when you typically stay with the project? Uh, yes, absolutely. And that's sort of one of the best scenarios to be in, I think, because you're already on the inside. Um, they would know you. If you're an in-house board artist at Cartoon Network, and you, they, they, they want your shows. So you go in and pitch to them, there's a really good chance that you would be a supervising producer at the very least on that. Um, if you're totally on the outside, um, well, let's think like if you've got a if you've got a skill uh, that can apply directly to the show that you've created, um, then there's a real good chance that you'll get hired to do that on your own show. Um, so you know it's it, it's not like they're going to say thank you very much, see you later. Uh, they they could, but it, it, you know you. It depends on sort of what you what you can offer uh, to the table in terms of once the show is sold, you know what what can you do? Um, if you're redundant in terms of your your skills um, and there are more qualified people, it may be that you have to kind of take a back seat. Um, I'm going to start looking through questions here. Um, um, so, how do you get an opportunity to pitch? Um, that's a real good question. Um, having an agent or a manager helps. Um, and, and if you've got ideas or, or sort of a background or a reputation uh, that tells an agent or a manager that you're going to make them money, um, it's pretty easy to get. But it's easier to get one, and then they can set those up. Um, you know, there are opportunities. Um, you know where. You know whether it's a pitch fest or you know um, artist access programs. A lot of the studios have. Um, it really sort of depends on. It really sort of it depends on sort of where you are in your career. Um, also, I think you know if you if you can make some kind of a splash online, like like right. for us it was mm -hmm. Kickstarter. But uh, I've I've seen recently a lot of people are selling shows just from little ideas that they'll post on like Instagram or yep. YouTube, um, story ideas, something that if you can prove that there's an audience that wants to see what you're doing, they will, yeah, you know, they might even find you. You might not have to even. Oh, that's, them. that's actually the way that you want to do it. And that is, let me tell you, if, if you guys are artists and you go to thank hopefully soon when we can back and do this in person, and you're sitting, you have a table in Artist Alley with some of the character concepts and stuff you've drawn, or even if it's visual development that you're selling prints for, I guarantee you 100% that, especially if it's uh, one here in LA, whether it's Lightbox or um, what's the other one, AT, ATX? C CTN. CTN, yeah. um, Comic-Con, uh, WonderCon, any of those ones that are here. New York Comic-Con, if you're on the East Coast, um, I'm trying to think of some that those are the, the, the main ones. I absolutely guarantee you 100% that every there is a development executive from every buyer that has walked by your table and has looked at your art. 
I can tell you this with absolute certainty. Um, and so you're not just selling prints to make some money to, to fans. You are actually unknowingly, or maybe knowingly, um, you're showing your work to the industry. Um, if you've got a brilliant idea with lots of great art, make it a, consider making it a children's book. Even if you have to self-publish, um, more shows are sold based on pre-existing material than they are from original pitches. That's just the way it is. Um, broadcasters want what they feel is a sure thing. Uh, so if it exists in some other form already uh, and they can sort of see it and it's tangible and they know that it's something, um, that, that's gonna give you a better edge, especially if you don't have access. Um, that's something that, um, yeah, I, I would say is, is an interesting point. Like if we were to do this again and, and say we were pitching our first you know, kids show that, that rather than sort of spending that time making, you know, the pitch, you actually just uh, make a kid's book, you know, that's kind of for the age range that you're, you're pitching the show to, and then pitch that to a publisher um, with the intention of, you know, one day it being a show. And obviously the contract will reflect that. But like you're saying, you know, it's like, in a way, it's almost an easier path to get to it selling is. a series than it is to, especially when you, when you lack contacts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been asked, how do you get a, an agent or a manager and what's the difference? Um, these days, uh, there's not a whole lot of difference, although technically, at least in the state of California, managers can't actively solicit employment for you. Um, that's not to say they don't already. Um, in the state of California, agents are actually franchised by the state. They're, they're licensed and regulated like a, like a real estate broker would be. Um, agents take 10% of all the money that you make from the jobs that you get. Managers are more interested in sort of the larger context of your career. Uh, they help point opportunities your way. Managers are often help more helpful um, by the, once you're already an established and bona fide um, show creator. Um, agents are usually better at actually getting you specific jobs. Um, Agents are a little tricky uh, for artists if it's just about getting, you know, like, hey, I'm a board artist. You don't really need a board uh, agent to get you a board artist job. But agents are often useful for, um, for uh, getting you access to studios to pitch. And how do you find an agent? Well, the best way is by referrals. So if you know someone that has an agent, uh, and you've got an idea that you're ready to pitch, um, show that to them and see if, and if, you know, see if they'll give you a referral. Um, otherwise, um, you know, th there's, you can make, let's call a blind submission. Uh, that is make a list of all the agencies and management companies that represent either animation artists or, um, and you know, I'll let you do your research for that. Uh, and you send them an email, say, hey, introduce yourself, give them your background, say, I've, I've got a few shows that I'm interested in, in pitching and I need some help. Would you be interested in taking a look at them? Um, if they're looking for clients, and oftentimes they are, um, they'll say, sure, uh, let me take a look. Uh, and then if they, if, if, if they see that there's a show to be sold here, um, they may not sign you to a permanent contract, but they might do what's called a hip pocket deal where they say, yeah, absolutely. I think this is a great deal. I'll, I'll, and if you're, if you're legit and, and, you know, they think that you're someone that can back up the show, um, with your, with your abilities then they'll set a meeting for you. Um, Amy also asked if you're already working in the studio system, do you think having an agent is, agent is useful? Well, I would say that if you're getting work, no. Um, if you don't need someone to get you jobs uh, and you don't need someone to get you access, they're only just going to take 10% of your hard-earned money. Um, Pongo wants to know, is it possible to completely lose the right to your show? Not under most circumstances if you're selling it to a, a legitimate bona fide studio. And that's why when you do a deal, you need to make sure you've got someone that looks over it, whether it's an agent, a manager, or a lawyer that makes sure that your contract is not screwing you out of the deal. And, and that does happen. Um, 
Uh, I'm gonna look just start scrolling back through here. Let's see if there's any sort of businessy ones. Um, I, by the way, uh, uh, just so our, our live stream doesn't last forever and ever and ever, once we wrap this up, um, maybe we can go over to the Discord server and just run into one of the chat channels there, and I can you know, we can answer more questions uh, through that um, if you guys want to. Um, let's see. I'm just I, I'm gonna I'll try to get to most of these. Um, is there, a, there's a lot, there's always a lot of questions about having your, your show stolen. Um, uh, you, and, and that's a, that's an absolutely genuine, um, reasonable concern to have. Um, and the answer is yes, it can happen. Yes, it has happened, but chances of it actually happening, um, are pretty small. Um, because um, I mentioned about what it cost uh, for a studio or a network or broadcaster to auction your idea. It might cost them, you know, a couple thousand bucks. That's a whole lot cheaper than fighting a lawsuit. Um, also, studios don't want to have the reputation of stealing from artists. It's not a good thing. Um, so generally speaking, they don't do it. Um, Here's the thing to remember though, uh, and I said this before, is that your brilliant idea, somebody already has come up with that idea. Um, and somebody's probably already pitched it. And that thing you're pitching, uh, somebody's probably already pitched a similar idea to that broadcaster that week. Um, so what you're looking at is the specific um, application, the specific expression of your idea. Um, if you put something online, post like post your thing, um, there's you know there are unscrupulous people that could go out there and be inspired by it, uh, and then you might see something similar uh, two years later and say, "Wow, that looks a whole lot like that thing I came up with." Probably a coincidence, maybe not, but really, honestly, there's not much you can kind of do about it unless you can prove that there was real malice and, and theft there. Um, one thing I like to try to remind people is you've got a great idea and you've come up with the pitch and you have your art and you have your story and you have your presentation. I think that's awesome. And it's a lot of work, a lot of blood, sweat and tears have gone into that. But there's always going to be the question that you're going to get, which is what else do you got? Anytime you pitch a show, you're going to hear that question. What else you got? So never, ever, ever go into a pitch with just one thing. You always have to have a couple, even if it's just like literally a sentence. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm developing this show about, you know, you know, you know, about, uh, it's you know, about monkeys in outer space that live on a space station. Um, I'd watch that. Yes, who would, right? <laughs> Great monkeys show. in space. Um, they would say, I love that idea. I'm just looking for a, sp a goofy space show. Can I see something? And you'll say, absolutely. I'm just putting a few little finishing touches on it. Can I send you some pages next week? And they'll be like, yeah, sure. And you go back to your studio, go back to your place. And then you quickly that week, you, you, you do it up. Um, always have a backup because there, there's nothing worse than going into a pitch in person and starting to pitch something, and this, this has happened to me and it will happen to you. If you start to pitch a show, you're 30 seconds in, 20 seconds in, this is what you're gonna hear. I, I'm really sorry, I'm gonna have to stop you right there. Mm -hmm. I really hate to do this, but we have a show in development right now that is really, really similar to what you're pitching me, unfortunately. So I can't take the pitch. Yeah, it's happened to us a, a, a bunch of times. In the it, last it will year. happen. It will happen. It will happen. If you're going out wide with the pitch, that one room that you're in, it will happen. Yeah. So now you've got 30 minutes of this hard to reach, hard to get executive time on the books. Mm -hmm. You've already spent five minutes on the chat, chit chat, and small talk. You, you better use it. So, oh, that's no problem. I got something else. Monkeys in space. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then vamp 
look, you know, improv, do something. All right, let's say you don't, you don't have a pitch in your back pocket. Okay, well, okay, turn this into a general meeting if you haven't already had one. Um, gosh, that's really too bad. Well, you know, if you've got in to get the pitch, they obviously think you're bona fide enough that they would want to work with you and at least buy a show from you. So now take that opportunity to ask like, well, so what are you looking for? What are the, what are some of the holes in your slate? What, what are you developing right now? Um, have them talk about like, you know, what they're working on, what, what they're doing. Now get a better sense of what that studio's sort of what, what, what their, what their vibe is right now. Ask them what, what they're looking for. Cause the other thing is too, um, again, I said this, you're not just selling a show, you're selling yourself. And if they love your art, they love your storytelling style, there's a real good chance that they've got something in development. Maybe a show that I sold them. That's just a whole bunch of words on a page. I guarantee you two weeks later, they might, you know, they're going to give you a call and say, Hey, sorry, we're going to pass on what you pitched, but dot, dot, dot. We'd love to still work with you because two things are going to happen. If, if they like your pitch and they like you, again, you're not just selling a show, you're selling yourself. You're, you're selling the fact that you are, you're legit. You're a nice person. You're not a weirdo. We're all a little bit weird, but just weirdo mm -hmm. enough that they want to work with you, that they, they want to see more from you. So one, one, one or more things are going to happen. You're going to get a call or an email saying, sorry, we're going to pass, but you're welcome to come back anytime. That first pitch, that is the goal, is, is, is to impress them enough that they want to invite you back to pitch again. So let's just uh, do a recap of where we're at. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm just. Uh, uh, um, uh, so the, the goal would be to you know get them to invite you back, or even give you a job on something else they're doing, whether it's visual development, whether it's being a board artist. Um, so that is you know that that's the goal. Um, executives and broadcasters are very. Um, I sort of said, what's the best word for it, Jim and Adam? They're, they're very sort of parental in the sense that they, they like having their people. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if they like you and they do the good, a good, you do, do a good job from them, whether it's, you know, selling them something, you're always going to have a place to take new things to them. Yeah. And then when yeah. they move to another studio, they will bring you with them. So yeah. this is a, this is a big part about sort of establishing your your network of contacts and, and the people that are your allies. Um, yeah, because I guess they're like people that you know they take all these meetings all the time and 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 you know time for them is is very you know yeah. you don't want to be wasting people's time. You want to just like if you go into one of these meetings, you want to be like super prepared because yeah you know. Um, Dominic's asking about any advice for European creators. Um, I would just say you're lucky um, because the nice thing about European creators, um, though it's technically, I guess, not Europe anymore, Adam is in the UK. <laughs> um, yeah. The nice thing about being a European creator is, is that you not only still have access to the American buyers, you have access to European buyers and there are a whole lot more of them than there are here. Uh, and assuming that you are a citizen of the EU, that allows you to have to give them all the necessary, you know, requirements for their, the, the the copious tax credits that they get depending on where you are. Um, I, I can't speak to how you know the same sort of you know access to direct pitching because it's different country by country. Um, but if you are in Europe or anywhere international, the same sort of concepts apply. Um, you'll just have to sort of figure out what the best access are. Uh, markets there, you know, a lot of the European markets, you know, a lot of main animation markets are in Europe. I mean, MIP, MIPCOM, uh, they have every year. Um, that's generally more business to business, but creators do go there to try to sell their stuff. Um, yeah, uh, um, let's see, what else? Um, let's 
see. Uh, so the guys are sort of working a little bit here on the one sheet. Do you guys want to talk about some of your, while I'm scrolling through questions, what, what your sort of approach is to, to doing a one sheet? Yeah, I mean, it's essentially, it's like you're, you're trying to capture, um, you know, you're trying to capture like personality, I think, in these drawings that people are going to see these drawings and just think, you know, I see like how that character could appeal, number one, to uh, an audience. The, the kids would connect with them. They would want to hang out with them. They'd want to play with them. So you, you've always got this um, fun, playful vibe going on. And then that also reflected in the colors as well. You know, like you want to avoid choosing st typical colors. Like you don't want a, a pirate ship where the boat is like the color of wood. You know, you got to think like, how do you make that, that that stand out? So that's kind of the way we're approaching this stuff. Yeah, I always, yeah. always go more visual. I guess in, in the one sheet, you want to have kind of a brief description of the story and the characters, but not, not too into detail. You don't want to like, start going too far into detail because then um you know when people starts heads start spinning you know you know you've lost them you want to keep it sort of like an elevator pitch on a page make it fun to look at make it colorful mm -hmm. make it you know try yeah. and capture maybe the vision you'd have the, the title and then maybe like a like a tagline yeah and maybe like the yeah. format you know like give them an indication yeah. of what kind of a show it is is it you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, is it uh, um, serialized, uh, episodic, you know, maybe not yeah. that, maybe yeah. just, yeah, maybe just the, uh, the idea. Um, it's been asked, uh, how important is it to have your pilot script already written? Uh, example, I, I would say don't write a pilot script unless you are a brilliant writer. Um, because if that's the first thing that they um, that they look at in terms of the written material and, you know, and that's what they're basing a green light on or even buying it for an option. Um, it, that may not be the best strategy. They will bring in an ace write, animation writer to take care of that for you or to do in collaboration with you. But that's not to say, look, if you want to write a pilot, do it. I mean, if anything, it gives you a great idea of what the show is. It, it, it you know, it, it if anything, it could be, you know, the great, a great exercise, you know, I often will, when I'm, when I'm sort of creating or developing a show, I'll do sort of a rough beat outline of what a show Bible will be. And then I don't even write the Bible until I've written one script. Um, because I don't really kind of know the, the nuances and I don't quite know these characters yet. Again, I'm not drawing them. So I think there's something about the the, the sort of the intimacy of drawing a character really gets them into you, I, I can only imagine. But for me, I have to write them. I have to make words come out of their mouth um, in, until I really kind of get to know them. Um, so I would say, I don't think a pilot script is gonna help you sell the show, but it might help you understand it better. Um, unsolicited pitches, uh, don't, don't send an unsolicited pitch. Um, just don't, um, uh, they will be ignored uh, and it will make you come off as looking uh, unprofessional. Um, if it's really, it's a, if it's a really, really, really good idea, uh, I promise you it will find the right eyeballs, um, but you just, can't, you just can't blindly email stuff around. Um, yeah, just do your due diligence, do, do the legwork, um, look, and I'll just say this, people ask me all the time, like, how do I get in, you know, they're outside looking in, how do I get in? Um, this specifically relates more to being an animation writer. Uh, but it's, it's I, I can't imagine it's, it's much different as an artist. Um, the, especially in television animation, which is the television animation for kids, is really the only thing I can speak with some authority on is, um, the, the cost and the barriers to entry are not that high. But the main and really only one is figuring out how to get in. Um, so it's sort of like, there's not necessarily, it's not like there's a secret handshake, um, but figuring it out and making your way in uh, is, is part of that process because it's gonna teach you how the business works. 
Um, and it, it may seem a little sort of, sort of flippant to say, go figure it out. Um, of course, asking lots of questions is, um, but your work will speak for itself and it will find the eyeballs it needs. But yeah, please don't send unsolicited people scripts to, to, to studios, even to writers uh, or other artists. Um, you know, talk to them, tell them about what you're doing, ask for advice. Um, I tell this to writers. Um, I tell this, and I, I would I guess you know, it's a little easier for artists because you can put your stuff out there and say, hey, have a look at this because it, it exists. Um, I always tell writers, don't ask a more senior writer to read your script. Don't, don't do it. Um, uh, because they don't even have time to read their friends scripts that they know. Um, so, you know, under most circumstances, they're not going to read yours. Um, get to know them, though. Um, you know, get on the inside. You know, go to the festivals, go to the conventions, hang around with the people that are doing it. Make a make a friendly nuisance of yourself, um, and pretty soon you're you're actually part of the crew. You know, you're one of us. Most of you, a lot of you, probably are one of us already. So it's then it's just about networking. Um, uh, so bridge shows, yeah, a lot of networks are looking for bridge shows because older kids aren't watching cartoons the same way they are, but they they are. And I wouldn't want to sell this as a preschool show because I want it to be crude and goofy. Um, and preschool shows just kind of handle, handle that. Um, let's see. Um, what I'm looking through here is show isn't going to work in one market, say the US is possible to pitch it in another market like the, uh, Australia. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, if you have access to, your, uh, to a local broadcaster, like you live in Australia or you live in Japan, yeah, definitely start there first. Um, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of, I mean, Cartoon Network, for example, has completely different divisions for Europe and Middle East and for Asia and for Latin America. Um, so there, and there are shows they make that, that aren't even on the air here in the United States. So yeah, whatever, um, whatever opportunity do you have, um, Uh, let's see. Uh, are there any tricks to getting a studio to budget and create a decision that they are originally against? Um, my trick is 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 if there if you're in an area of of, of of disagreement, is to try to understand what why they dis what where the disagreement is about. If you can sort of understand where they're coming from, let's say you get a note you don't under, you disagree with, try to understand where the note is coming from. Then if you can understand where the note is coming from, you can often find a compromise solution that makes everyone happy. And then you try to make it feel like it's their idea and then they go for it. So a lot of times it's not about, it's really, they just wanna be heard and they wanna have, um, they wanna have a, um, a voice in the process. And so helping to figure out a way they can generally does. Um, that's, a good, a, that's a good yeah. question because like, oh, that happened a lot on Nico was a lot of the time it was just a misunderstanding. And so really the key is to understand why someone feels a certain way because you kind of will, the compromise is sort of like the two parties really understanding and then coming to a, a even better solution. Um, that happens all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and just to clarify on unsolicited, it's not a full pitch, just key art and tagline. Um, I would even say that, yeah, um, uh, don't send it. But if you've got a social media following or if it's something that you're kind of creating to put out there in the world um, and you have a way to get it out there, um, you know, there are development executives at broadcasters and that's their job to look out for stuff. Um, and so maybe it'll, they'll come across it that way. Um, but again, look look for there are opportunities for people that are sort of outside the the you know sort of on the outside still you know before before you're sort of you know kind of working for a studio or have dir easy direct access um, you know a lot of studios a lot of broadcasters will have opportunities to use almost sort of like portfolio reviews um, a lot of them will have sort of artist programs where they sort of develop. Um, you know, new artists and new ideas. 
Um, you know, so look for those. Um, all right, I, it's taken me a while to sort of pick, to, to, to scroll through questions, but if you've got one that you really want to answer that I haven't already, type it back in again um, if you're still on board, uh, and I'll, I'll we'll try to get to it. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, so this is sort of a just sort of a, a, a brief sort of look at um, you know how brainstorming works, um, how the pitching process works. Um, you know, some cool backgrounds. We could even sort of, you know, this could be something that we uh, that we take somewhere. Who knows? Mm. Yeah, I think for you know two hours, we pretty much got a good a good start. Uh, I think, yeah, we could definitely um, t you know take it further. I, I kind of like the idea of the boat being sort of like a unicorn. Uh, mm. That's kind of unique. I haven't seen that before. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think it's like, you know, this, this process is like, it's sort of like doing this over and over again and sort of like, you know, each time you do it, each time you think about these characters more, you know, like I love those, uh, the villains that are, um, they're like mean girls and yeah. so they're just kind of this, I can imagine like this like boat full of sort of bossy, uh, you know, I, I think they would be really fun. But, uh, yeah. but obviously this is sort of the stereotypical first pass. So then the next pass, you know, you might get into more uh, nuances and different, uh, different ideas. Yeah. Um, Jason was asking about spec scripts. Um, yeah, spec scripts are a great way to sort of have a writing sample. So I said a good, a good idea to have, you know, if you're a writer and, and wanting to, to you know, work in that world is to have spec scripts mostly, to, you know, to the idea of, of understanding how you know, a show sort of feels on the page um, as a sample of your work to show that you can you can kind of write in the voice of another show. But it's also really good idea to have original scripts because um, that shows you shows a, a, a person in a hiring position as a writer um, sort of what your voice is. Um, I don't often tend to read spec scripts uh, mostly because I'm kind of going off of personal relationships and recommendations. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to get in to be an animation writer simply because there are a lot of us and the ones that are even working are always still looking for work. So it's one of those things that sometimes takes a couple of years to, to kind of break into. Um, but in the very least, spec scripts are great uh, as exercises in, in writing animation. Um, uh, Oscar wants to know about taking a pitch to events like Kid Screen. Um, Kid Screen is great. I've been a few times. Again, it's sort of not one of those things a lot of independent creators go to. It's more business to business. Kid Screen, for those of you who don't know, is a conference that happens every year in February and it's in Miami now, uh, where broadcasters and studios go basically to like try to sell stuff to each other. Um, it's great for crea independent creators because there's not a lot of other people. But the thing about kids screen is you just can't go and show up and hope to get meetings. That's one of those things where you have to plan ahead and get um, and get meetings ahead of time. Um, credentials are a little expensive, uh, but when you do, you'll know who's there. You can send emails and say, hey, you know, I, I've got some ideas. Can I have 10 minutes of your time? Otherwise, to show up in Miami and hang out in the bar of the of the Intercontinental where they have it and, uh, and make contacts and friends that way. Um, let's see, what else? Um, so I marked a picture series with the cast of characters of color because my series concept is cast characters are predominantly black. Um, that is awesome and we need more of that. So um, not only is there a market, uh, for that, uh, there is uh, an, an active market that is their studios and networks are being much more aggressive um, and, and not just changing characters to suit a certain, uh, certain audience, uh, but actively seeking diverse voices, diverse creative, diverse creators um, that reflect the world is as it is. Um, 
So I say that right now is a real, everyone's thinking about this. It's in the consciousness of, of the creative community, especially. I mean, I think Black Lives Matter has had a tremendously positive impact on the creative community. Um, not to say that we haven't in the last few years uh, from sort of broadcast perspectives been looking to, 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 to be more inclusive, uh, but they, everyone now is really actively looking for more, um, to be more inclusive, uh, more equitable, I even want to say, in looking for show creators. Uh, so I would say now is, is, is a really great time. Um, uh, can I pitch uh, concept art? Um, if you have an idea for a show and you're not a writer, uh, well, yeah, I mean, if it's a, if it's a, here, here, so here's something to think about. If you have an idea for, and this is something to me you want to put in your heads. Um, if, are, if you say I have an idea for a show, or are you saying I have a show? Because um, an idea for a show is just that, it's an idea. Um, if you have a show, it's, it, that implies to me that it's way more fleshed out. So if you have an idea for a show, maybe you want to partner with a writer, or maybe you want to try writing it yourself and see where it goes. Maybe you want to, maybe you want to flesh it out. You know, are, do you have just that one pager or do you have the whole series thought out in terms of the characters, the world building, the, the what type of episode, you know, what's the episode about? Um, it's easy to come up with a show idea. Um, Sometimes it's not easy, but sometimes it is. Uh, you know, we come up with ideas all the time, but ask yourself the question, can you make a hundred of these? And if you can off the top of your head, um, think of 20 episodes, story ideas for an episode, maybe you got something. Um, because sometimes really, really good ideas for a show don't actually make good shows. Um, and so finding, finding that this, the thing that does finding that way in, because that's what the broadcaster is going to be looking for. They're going to be, when they hear your pitch, they're going to be thinking about, hey, um, I like the idea, but is it a show? Can I see us doing 100 of these? Um, the idea of a, a, um, a show is X meets Y. You know, it's, it's, it's SpongeBob in space. It's, it's 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 Paw Patrol uh, with um, with firefighters instead of or, or you know it's whatever your whatever your X meets Y is yes absolutely um, everyone's looking for an easy way in um, and if that helps um, set it up uh, sure um, uh, you know I sold a show that I said it was um, Doc McStuffins meets Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That, that was my original pitch for the show that's now called Abby Hatcher on Nickelodeon. Uh, it's changed a lot since then. It originally wasn't a preschool show, then it turned into a bridge show, then it turned into this and that. So it's gone, the development of that took years and years and did a lot of different things. But yeah, I sold it as Doc McStuffins meets Buffy the Vampire Story. Little kid that catches and helps monsters. Um, and it, it, someone bit. Um, it's the same pitching process when you wanna do a short. Um, sort of, but in the terms of a short, it's different because um, it's a short is just a short. It's a one-off. So you're look, basically looking for someone to give you money to make a, a, a single thing. Um, so the concept of doing it in a way that gets someone excited about it, yes. Um, but I also think the idea of knowing your audience, um, you know, are they actively looking for shorts? Um, might help there. But yeah, I mean, short's a little easier because you could almost pitch the entire thing. Rather than a show, which is pitching a show, which is more of the broad concept, for a short, you honestly could even do, if you're a board, art, if you're a board artist, you could actually probably draw boards. You could do an animatic for the whole thing and then they could see it. Um, but I've never really sold a short, so I, I, I can't speak with any sort of authority um, to that. Um, um, if you have a show, develop a pitch book and meeting with the studio to set it up, question, how do I get another studio to look at it? Um, I would say, um, 
well, is it maybe is the can you use the whatever resources you did to get into the first studio? Um, the the other way, perhaps, uh, is is and there's nothing wrong with sending an unsolicited email to a person at a studio uh, or a broadcaster. If if let's say I'm you're going to pitch to Disney, and there's nothing wrong with you getting it sending an email to someone at Netflix and saying, hey, I want to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Rob Hokey. I'm, I've got a show that I've, I've created. I'm going out now. I'm, I'm, I'm taking out pitches. I've already got a meeting set up over at Disney. Uh, I was wondering if you might like to take a look at it. Um, and then, you know, send them your resume, send them a link to some of the work you've done. Um, uh, not the actual pitch, but, and then give them the opportunity and they might say, sure, send it along. Um, um, shows dealing with the disabled safe to pitch. Um, I think, sure, absolutely. Um, it probably would help that it, given today's sort of sensitivity about uh, the origins of shows, if, if you are yourself or someone involved has a disability. Um, again, I think that Authentic voices uh, are are important, um, and so yeah. I mean, there, there's no such thing as a bad idea, in, in you know, in, the, in that sense. Um, um, a lot of questions about copywriting. Um, you can, if you have a script, you can send it to the Writers Guild and the Writers Guild of America, and they'll register it. Um, it, um, you know, but honestly. You know, if, if you don't worry so much about getting your stuff stolen, um, it, it's 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 a natural reaction. But the fact is, is that you know, if don't don't wrap your whole life up in one idea. You know, you got to have lots of them. Um, so uh, it, it you know, collaborations happen, things change. Um, Think of how so, hard it would be to actually steal an idea like this. Yeah. We're posting this publicly. Like, I can't imagine someone like s sort of taking this and then, you know, walking into someone's office and going, I got an idea here. Here's the idea. You, I think it's it's the actual process is so long and, and you, you know, you have to go through many meetings and discussions on the idea and, and the, there's a whole progression behind it. Like, Stealing an idea, if you if you if you were setting out to do that, would be such a weird waste of time. I think, um, you know, yeah. I mean, just I don't I can't see that happening. Um, Alyssa asking about, do you feel it's uh, the showrunner of the studio to hire sensitivity editors for certain aspects of the story? Um, I, I, I'm not quite understand that completely, but I'm wondering if maybe what you mean is. You know, a lot of shows will have uh, sort of an expert um, or someone on board that might um, deal with a specific aspect of the show. Uh, for example, um, I'm doing a series right now that has an aspect, aspect of it that deals with mindfulness. So we actually have a couple of mindfulness experts on the, that, that, are, that read the scripts, that look at the storyboards, uh, that, and then they give us um, input and advice. Um, that's generally the studio suggests that the showrunner could could suggest an individual person. But you know, anytime a series deals with an aspect that's outside the experience or expertise of the people making the show, it's always a good idea to have someone involved that does, whether or not they're a consultant or actually on the staff. Um, uh, about access to Netflix or Disney connections, um, uh, that's that's the that's the trick. Um, you know, they they generally don't um, like sort of emails out of the blue, but that's you know that so it's sort of chicken or the egg. Um, that's why I think it's important to sort of create uh, you know a professional um, persona for yourself. Are you someone that 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 you know has a table at conventions? You know, do you have a huge Instagram following for your art? Are you already working at um, 
are already working in the industry uh, in some, on some capacity. Do you have a friend that knows someone at Netflix that's in the position to talk to you? And will that friend make an introduction? Um, everything, you know, there, there, there is a truth to the idea. It's all about connections and it's all about relationships. And some of that is, it, it's part of it is, and it's not about people will only work with their friends. That, that's just not true. Although it is sometimes, it's mostly about the fact that you know, look, we want to be around and work with people that we know and we trust. And, and so if you know someone that can help you get access, you have a friend, a colleague, uh, that's seen your project and they back you up and think it's brilliant. And they know someone at Netflix and they're willing to send an email to them or, or next time they see them at, a, at an event or a party, not these days, but you know, in, in in the real world and say, hey, I've got someone, um, you know, can I, uh, can I send them your way? And they'll say, if they know that friend and trust them, they'll say, sure. If you have the ability, go to Comic-Con. You must go to Comic-Con. That is where all the animation people are. There are three or four parties during the course of Comic-Con where all the animation people are. Uh, and if you're an industry person or at least have a tangentially availability to get in, you know, go. Um, and, and you can seek them out, introduce yourselves, and now you have a contact. Um, or go with a friend, travel in packs. If you know someone, introduce that person, work, work the networking is hugely, hugely important. Um, right, so Amy is saying about, if you're doing a show featuring disability or disabled, it can be problematic. Yes. Absolutely, and yes, in that circumstance, you would 100% want to have someone either involved closely on the show that 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 is that is an expert in disability, uh, the specific disability, or in general, or you would have someone. Um, I did a show where one of the characters had a speech impediment, uh, and so we actually we actually got the help of an organization that deals with speech um, disabilities uh, so that we were doing it right. Um, and suggestions having a more diverse cast, even though you aren't, that one's easy. Um, hire a diverse cast. Hmm. That, you know, that, that one is, that one's super simple. That, that you know, um, animation, it's all voice acting. So make them sound different, you know, make them, you know, uh, so, well, voices are voices. So the thing of it is, is that, that that's the trick. When it's an on-camera thing, obviously you're seeing the actor in real life. It's a two-pronged two thing. Make the, the show look diverse, okay? Um, that's easy enough if you're using human characters. It's not even an issue if you're all your characters are animals. Um, but voice acting, it gets a little different because voice actors can make any voice. So what... What, what does it mean to have a diverse voice? I, I mean, I don't know what that means. Um, so that really just becomes making sure that the ca cast that you use is diverse. Um, and there are so many brilliantly talented voice actors out there. You know, I would say that without even trying, most of the time um, they, it ends up being that way. Um, but you know, you know, it's, it's something to definitely think about. Um, pitching experimental uh, animation like Tumble Leaf, Stop Motion, or Gumball. Uh, that, that's great, but just, I, th I think you would pitch it exactly the same as you would any other great story, but I think that you would rely a lot more on um, the visual aspects of, of the show. So you would need to make sure that, that when you're selling your pitch, that, the uniqueness of the visuals is um, is, is really a big part of the um, thing. Can you be overprotective of an idea? Um, no, I guess is the is the question. I think it's much more important to get it out there, if, if especially if you don't have access. If if you're if you're using if you need to use the sort of the self publishing model to do it, get it out there. But, but be smart about it. Um, you know, try to do it in a way that makes it look like it's a thing. Um, 
uh, what's the biggest piece of advice you wish you'd been told when entering the industry? What, what do you guys think? What would yours be? The biggest piece of advice for entering yeah, the industry. Yeah, for, when you're entering the industry, what would your biggest piece of advice be? I would say network, like get out there and meet people, like, you know, introduce yourself. Don't, you know, don't be shy because um, when I first started out, I kind of had this, you know, almost a bit of a mindset that like, oh, if I do good work, people will come to us. But it's, it's all about who you know and all those questions mm. about, you know, how do I get into Netflix? Like it's taken us 15 years to get to the stage where we've networked enough that we know someone who knows someone who knows an exec in Netflix and you can actually call on them for a favor. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have to network on LinkedIn, on, you know, on social media, talk to people, write to artists you like, but also like Rob's saying, go when, you know, the, the, the lockdown's lifted, go to as many events as you can. It's, it's a lot of money, but it's, it's pays, pays dividends in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, Jim, what about you? Well, mine was, uh, you know, if you're going to school for whatever, like we went to school for animation, be nice to everyone that's in your class. Cause you know, one day those are the people that are going to get you a job. Those are the people that are going to, you know, hopefully hire you or, or open up doors for you. So mm -hmm. it's important to get along with people and, 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 you know, don't be a jerk. Yeah, that's so true. The assistant that you're talking to or emailing with in five years is going to be the executive that hires you. And they're going to remember when you were just trying to get your foot in the door. Um, you know, that junior executive that's brand new to the business and is giving you notes on this thing. And you've even if you've had 20 years of experience, that junior executive that's giving you notes that you know are ridiculous and don't agree with, you've got to find a way to make that person your ally and 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 make that work because that's the person in five more years is going to be running the studio that's going to buy your show and they're going to remember it's like oh man rob was a real jerk to me and i'm never going to take a, a pitch from him i'm never going to buy a show from him so but that same person that remembers boy i was such a green noob executive and there was this experienced showrunner that was so nice and genuine to me and really made me feel like I was a collaborative person. I want, I will do anything for that person. You're making your allies. Um, for me, I think it would be, be patient. Um, yeah. It takes a while, and especially when you're young and you've got gazillions of great ideas. Um, be patient, try to get on the inside. Like if you want to work in animation, um, and you haven't sold a show, if, you, if you're trying to sell a sh an animated series and you haven't really gotten a, a, like a bona fide job working in animation, that should probably be your first step. Um, yeah. You don't have to live in LA. There's animation all over the world. Every major city now has a big studio. Try to get a job there, you know, you know be flexible. Um, so you want to be a storyboard artist, but you know, you may, but you got to start as a revisionist or you got to start as a cleanup colors, background colors, take any job you can get, be in there, work hard, make friends, make contacts, get on the inside, be patient. You're all so talented and your work will get you there. But sometimes you've got to have a job that gets you on the inside while you're doing your own thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, when I first got started, um, I was pitching live action shows. I didn't know I wanted to work in animation until that opportunity came. And, and I very early on had opportunities to, to have some pretty remarkable pitches where I was in front of heads of networks. And it was, I thought, oh my God, I got it made. And I think the worst thing that could have happened to me is if I would have sold a show that early in my career. Um, mm. Because it would have gone to someone else and I wouldn't have had anything to do with that. I might have been lucky if I got a staff writer job on it. But once I got into animation and I started working my way up, it finally got to the point where I was a story editor and then producer level, um, you know, and I was developing stuff and getting shows greenlit, but only then and only then, you know, where I, when I started actually getting shows sold, was I in a position where I actually could be the person that makes the show. Um, so if you're new and starting out and you sell a show, congratulations, great news, you sold the show. Bad news, you're probably not going to have much to do with it. Um, it's just the way it's going to be because they're going to hire much more experienced people to do it for you. So uh, that's not to say don't go out there and pitch your shows. 
Uh, but if you have that one dream project, the thing that you've been coming up with since you were six years old, the one thing that you that that you know you know no one else has come up with that idea, and you want to put it in your pocket, wait till you're in a position in your career where you can finally bring it out and say, okay, here it is, uh, and then you'll know all the people um, that can say yes, and you'll have a bidding war, or maybe you'll already have a studio deal, and they'll say here it is. Uh, and they'll say, great, let's make it. So um, what do you guys think? Should we? Uh, yeah, well, I, I we think that, um, that I mean, so, I, I'm, I've kind of run out of time. Um, I mean, do you guys want to run over to Discord real quick or do you want to call it quits? So here we go. We got the final thing here on the screen. All right. Um, yeah, there's a pitch. That's pretty good. Two and a half. We did it in two and a half hours. A little bit longer than we anticipated. Zoom, zoom out on there because on the YouTube gym, it's there. You go. Yeah, there's a little you, delay, so it, it should be. So there's enough there, right, Rob? You could take that in and and you know, give them a sense of the the whole show, basically. Absolutely. I might do a little photoshopping to kind of spell it out a little more. I mean, I yeah. think that if I were to take this, I think this is a great sort of character exploration. Hmm. Um, and I think maybe what I would do is, is I would, I, I would probably have a, a, probably a little more polished one sheet mm -hmm. and I would, I would probably have a little bit more sense of the background of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, let's, uh, all right, everyone says, let's go to discord, but let's just go for, I, I'm only going to have a little bit. Let's go to the, um, uh, the chat room. I'm gonna go to the animation chat room. Um, I don't know if there's a way to. Okay, so I will end our stream. Uh, thank you for everyone. Here, let's put it on our faces so they can see. Yeah, it. thanks, guys. It's an amazing turnout as well. We're humbled yeah. by uh, yeah. everyone That's showing absolutely. up for this, this talk. I don't know how to make a link to the Discord channel to post it in the, um, in the, uh, in the chat here. Um, but yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll we'll jump over to Discord for just a few minutes uh, to pick up any last uh, last minute questions. Uh, it's going to be um, the Lightbox Expo Discord channel. Go into Hall C Animation in the chat room for animation. All right. Thanks, All right. guys. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Peace out.